Hi guys, I'm gonna wait, give a bit of time for people to come into the room. So if anyone objects to me recording, I am going to be recording this. I'm going to be recording this locally on my computer. So um, just be aware that that is going on. So if no one wants to show the face, doing, but I'm yeah. sure you're all uh, as uh, beautiful as you can possibly be. So um, don't be afraid. This is just, uh, just all friends here. Uh, just to interject really quick. Uh, my camera, for some reason, isn't okay. being recognized. So, is that a problem for now, you? Or? You will default to not having your camera on. Please, if you want to show your face, you need to turn your camera on. It's down the bottom left. Okay. And it won't even detect it for me. And you've still got people coming into the room, so we'll, we'll hold it for a second. Okay. Okay. Now I need to just check my audio and everything uh, because uh, I don't want to miss the audio on this. I don't know if you can hear me, but uh, uh, okay. Right. So I need to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I ask uh, David? Bitilia to speak so that I can check that the audio is working my end. <laughs> can you hear me, Bob? Okay, so we don't have. Have you turned your audio on? No, you're not muted. So this might be my problem. Yeah, if no, I I'm, my audio I'm not muted. Yes. I can hear you now. So you're, you're okay, good. good. Okay, so can we do a sound chest? This sound chest? Oh dear, <laughs> I should have had more sleep. <laughs> can, we, can, we, can we have a sound check then? <laughs> All right, so uh, Hank, can we have a sound check from you? Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Crystal clear. Excellent. All right. Uh, okay, there's some more people coming to the room. So we just do a sound check on the people we've got here. Okay, so Stephen, can you do a sound check, please? Okay, peekaboo, hello. Yeah, that's great. Peter, can you do a sound check? Is that me? That's you. Wonderful. Uh, Gerald, can you do a sound check? That'll be a no. Ask to unmute. I'm going to ask you to un... Okay, maybe you don't want to talk. <laughs> Artifact, can you do a sound check? Okay, Artifact doesn't like to talk. <laughs> Yeah, no mic. Okay, that's fine. The Divinity. Okay, nothing from uh, Divinity. Dan. Hey, Bob. Hey, everybody. Hi, Dan. How's it going? That's Hi. crystal clear. Thank you very much. Oh, lovely. Riandalful. Okay. Hi, Bob. Yes, we're here. Excellent. Fantastic. Diadem. I'm here. Wonderful. William? Yeah, sounds Fantastic. good. Fantastic. David Watson? David? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear? You're beautiful. Wonderful. Oh, Excellent. brilliant. Excellent. And Corky? Okay, Corky's connecting his audio. David, do you have video? I do, but I, I prefer not to use it because I'm laying across the bed at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> okay well i won't push push it's it. been a long day <laughs> <laughs> yeah i bet it has so uh, okay so um uh, i'm going to turn this computer off because it's whining at me because it's hot in here and i'm i'm recording on this one so uh, we should be able to post this a little later um it is being um, recorded locally so let me turn this one off so it's not making this is gerald here did you get my test uh sound test can you hear me oh gerald that's great yes thank you Okay, so thank I you. think we're all good apart from high artifact, long time, no C. <laughs> Great, excellent. Okay, Gerald, okay, yes, Corky, wonderful. Okay, I, I would imagine you were going to be in your kitchen showing off your nice work service. 
I'll walk over. I'll take it over. I'll I look forward there. to it. Okay. All right. Um, okay. All right. <laughs> So I, I, I don't know who wants to start, but I'll, I'll say a couple of things that I've been thinking about uh, over this last week. Um, uh, I have to say, absolutely fantastic job, everyone that's been uh, trying to uh, build these coils. Uh, there are some of you that have been more open than others in, in terms of what you're doing. Um, maybe I can share some of the work that's been going on, but um, if, if those people on the chat can't share their own work. However, um, one, one person went out and bought 700 uh, uh, um, Toshiba ferrite cores, uh, these little ones, all consistent made, and they have sent a uh, proposal for, for building these things. Um, uh, some people have built machines. Uh, David Lier has built a machine, and I think David Watson has built a, a machine to make these things. I'm going to add some uh, John into the chat now. And so we, we've got some people building them, uh, and we're getting some initial results in from people, which is all very, very good. Uh, okay, John, we're going to do a sound test for you in a second. Um, but uh, th th there may be other ways to do this uh, within myself, David, uh, and Alan Goldwater, and, and Henk Yuren. We've been discussing potentially um, 3D printing these things, but there are a lot of problems with uh, having support structures and those kind of things when you are doing uh, 3D printing. So it's not, necess not necessarily going to be the way forward. Um, I, I do like some of these automated uh, uh, sort of spindle type structures that people are building. And I think uh, David has done a great job. And I think actually, I don't know, Hank will be able to talk about his experience uh, in how he built his in, in a little while. Um, and uh, I think when I, when I look at David's and I look at Hank's and, and I know David Butilia has been discussing this, I think there's something that we can do in terms of um, uh, building a 3D support for the central structure. And if people can give me the dimensions, and I think the easiest one I can see right now is David's that he sent earlier today. I can actually build a 3D printable core that um, people can then wind the, the sub elements around so that they end up with a very much more regular field structure. And we got, I've got David uh, Butillier is waving something around. Yeah, okay. so. I mean, that's, that's like you, you've got a donut there. Okay. Um, and I actually thought today uh, it's potential that we could get one of these contracting uh, PCB manufacturers uh, to just make loops on a PCB and then you could uh, perfectly arrange them because there'll be flat disks with a loop on and you could just make them in the hundreds and then just arrange them around some sort of 3D structure. So I, do, I don't know. It might be a lot of soldering and stuff. Uh, but you would get perfect loops and then make loops of loops and loops and loops of loops. But I still think the best way is the kind of automated wiring processes that are, that are going on and then having a, the top level tour being a support. So I think because uh, just because they uh, because uh, Hank was first to build a core and start testing it, uh, um, if he's OK, um, I'd be very happy if he could go first and, and maybe discuss his experience. Okay, you need to unmute. Okay. Yeah, I have to unmute. Um, yeah, where where shall I start? Um, so to talk about the the process that uh, uh, and your your idea of how to build it because you you very rapidly built something that yeah uh, looks similar to what was being desired. Well, I I, I took a wire of um, of one meter. I I, I took a drill. An old one that you can put um, where you can put on an, um, a variac, and I adjust the speed, and I just was hand winding um, coils of one meter, uh, did, and it, it just takes a lot of time. That's it. Um, but when you get uh, get used to it, it 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 goes fairly quickly. I made today I made a three again and I want to add them to the, the coil I have the big one so I have 20, 28 probably maybe maybe 29 I think 28 um, uh, uh, large windings you can say on on, on on the last last donut and then um, it's more evenly uh, um, 
arranged around the, the, the last circle. And, and, and I hope, hopefully, the, um, the coils are more aligned. Uh, now it's a little bit wobbly, uh, but then it's probably uh, quite evenly um, arranged around the last circle. So I hope then it's, it, that I can measure some difference in the field. But up till now, it's uh, it, it seems to be. Uh, I've seen a, an, a drawing of a, a field, um, one of these last last presentations, and it seems to be like a big ball, like a big big ball of um, magnetism. There is no electricity. I don't measure any electrical field. It's very strange, but I don't. So, um, and and that's what it is. Uh, today I did some metals in there when i put a block of aluminium in in the center of the core it seems to change a little bit but not much piece of iron didn't change much so it, it it's like um, a very stable situation um, um not, not changing much when when you change the, the parameters um, so yeah so I think I, think I expected something else, thing. but uh, I, I don't. It's very, very, uh, very plain. Uh, um, so I guess the first thing is all you what is say. the left, right, right configuration of your coil? Uh, it's a left, 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 four times left. Okay. And I, I thought uh, that was what I could see in the picture of the bagel. Uh, uh, it was the same direction. So I thought, well, just do it. Mm -hmm. Uh, today I had a, a, a three-level coil. Uh, last last test, uh, I made a left-left-left coil, and it was just magnetic, uh, but on three layers, not four like the, the big one. Um, and that was also left-left-left uh, turns, um, and I uh, magnetic again, not electric, magne magnetic again, and um, but then. Uh, I rewound it uh, like left because it's the basic coil. I cannot change that one uh, to left, right, right. And then it didn't change anything. No, not measurable. I didn't measure too much, but uh, it seemed to be the same. And you, you had two observations, one, one electrical and one magnetic, with a, with, where one varied when you were changing the input power and yep. one didn't vary when you were changing the input power. Exactly. So could you, um, can you describe the difference between the two? Well, the, the, diff uh, it, it, um, mag the ma magnetic field is, uh, yeah, I don't know if it's linear, but it's almost linear. When you dial up, uh, I use an, an, an audio amplifier uh, to and, and put on a sine wave and, and I put it on maximum power. It's about 20 watts, I think. At least it's 20 volts um, uh, AC. And then when I dial it, uh, it, it the, the magnetic field goes straight up and down with uh, the power I put to the coil. There's nothing. Um, but when I but uh, the electrical field is, is a very strange one because uh, when I, I today I turned on off all the power, uh, all the mains power. So it was never no elect electricity around, and then it is zero. No, I I don't measure at, at the place where I do the test, no electric field at all with um, the, the, uh, the the tier two uh, uh, tool. Um, then switch, and then I, when I switch it on again, um, I have uh, around the, 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 the microscope, the microscope, the, the, the the oscilloscope, uh, the, the power supply of the, 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 the power amplifier and, uh, and, and more stuff. There is, a, 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 say, four or 500, uh, I don't know, the volts per meter um, electrical charge. Uh, I can measure it. Also on the coil, that's the same. Because it's connected to the amplifier, the whole setup is like uh, one big electric field and then but then when i start when i put the meter in the coil or next to the coil 
and I change the, the power from zero to maximum, mm -hmm. nothing changed. It's, it's absolutely nothing. So it's, it's absolutely uh, no electrical change, field change. Very strange. But um, and you, you also found that you when when you did a pulse, there was a, an effect when you just attached a twelve volt battery and just tapped it. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I was today. I was uh, yeah the battery. Yeah. Then I when you touch uh, uh, take the, the the twelve volt battery. Uh, it's just when you connect it, it's just like the pulse when you connect it, you see a magnetic pulse in it and, and nothing more. And when I, I have the waveform um, generator, uh, so I can, I started with the sine wave, but when I take the triangle or the, so the slope uh, or the, the pulse or the block wave, um, it doesn't, really change the magnetic field electric there's nothing changing um but you can see uh, on the slopes of the um, of the the block that uh, you get these uh, on the edges you get uh, uh, yeah the, the typical induction type of sparks uh, or, or so you, you can see that there is a an, an, uh, magnetic uh, induction type of, uh, 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 how does a, a, a coil work? And that's the same type of uh, behavior, I think. Are you, are you, how are you matching, because you're using an amplifier to drive it, how are you matching the impedance from the output of the amplifier to the actual coil? I don't, uh, I, I okay. measured, I measured, uh, no. Uh, just uh, I measured 10 ohms, um, uh, just plain um, resistance. So mm. I, I thought, well, then I can't blow up my. Uh, my what is, uh, that? is it four or eight ohm output? I don't know. It's probably eight. Um, so it's it, it it matches. I I, I see on an oscilloscope that it is a, a perfect sine wave. Uh, what comes through so it, it and then suddenly it starts uh, clipping the the top of the sine wave and then i stop so i i i, I i'm sure that it is a very um that it is a neat uh, sine wave i do the same with the the slope um, the triangle you can say the slope uh, signal when it starts uh, uh, topping off the, the tip I stopped with uh, the amplifier. I don't put in more power. I stop with the power. So I think what you've done is 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 one level beyond uh, the chap that has bought seven hundred inductor filled coils. Uh, you, you've gone for the one two three tor as a single unit, and then you're ganging those together. Now, of course, Schwerblis is saying that it needs to be constructed from a single piece of wire, but is, is that the most important thing? Because you are soldering these segments together, which gives you the flexibility to change one order of the, whether it's left or right, which is what you've done in, in a test, as far as I understand it, more, most recently. So uh, I don't know whether it's that important to build it out of one continuous piece of wire. And I think that may be something we can you know, question like later down the line because you, you're, you're having junctions, is there some sort of uh, junction effect going on even though they're soldered together electrically? Is there something that, that might affect it there? I don't know. And then the other, the other point is, is that um, of course you were very quick to deliver something and it was showing something interesting, um, but the, is it how important is obviously nature is producing an extremely regular self-organized structure and so uh, it's difficult with the, the way you've made it without any extra supports and spaces precisely locating it to make sure that the fields are um, able to work sympathetically and resonantly. And so maybe that is that is important. Um, yeah, I know. But, uh, I, I expect uh, that, that that's nature. It, it has to be, um, that is what, more experimentalists have to uh, have to do it. I mean, when you, uh, 
I don't know how sensitive it is to change um, uh, dimensions. Um, th th that's the point. Um, I just started with a wire. Yeah. Uh, I just took the the the, the, the four um, the D four D ratio I started with, um, but it's not exactly. Of course, it's uh, it's uh, almost there. But I don't know how sensitive it is to this. Um, change in dimensions yeah and then the other thing we know from bostick's work and from uh the observation on the uh, fracture sample and from the observation of the actual physical structures on your vega valley that they are pinched on the inside and is that yeah. something that that is what nature is doing yeah to make this coils right so that the field shape is correct and you are focusing these pointing vectors into the, the, the center or wherever they're occurring, do we yeah. need to exactly replicate what nature is to do it properly? Uh, we're a bit of an advantage than, than all the, these other actors that are because we can see what nature does itself. And so I would imagine that as we move forward, we need, we need to find a way to create at least, I would suggest on the macro scale, these uh, tori which are at least distorted in, into the pinch and that would maximize the packing of the overall structure which then maximizes the flux through each tier of, of the structure and that's when it becomes something that oh, if you could do it in additive manufacture then you could actually make it correct but then it's, it's a complicated thing to build in an additive manufacture test now, David can talk about, uh, David Butilia can talk about his concept, which I think is fantastic. But again, it's got problems with achieving it. And that is to create, let's say, if we can, you can print glass, not that, but I think actually the best way to do this would be to print brass. And this is one thing you can print. print. And we would print a 3D tube of brass and run plasma through it. So we are. So actually, we that, are that's an interesting concept, Bob. And uh, the problem I have with it being brass is that it is a conductor, so it's going to short out any electric potentials along that axis. I agree. If you the could print is, glass, glass, you could definitely. The, the glass is not very high resolution. You, you can print. So I thought about the conductor thing. Um, you can print steel, and you might be all brass, and you might be able to just flow some non-conductor coating that you coat the inside of it by pumping it through like in a high temperature enamel paint yeah, maybe but i kind of like the idea Perhaps. Of having, yeah um, the the steel you can do very high resolution printing which is completely the direct laser metal sintering it le leaves it very very uh, uh, uh homogenous and i and when i was looking at this back in i think it was 2014 and i visited the the group in um in the in the uk uh, you can have very small wall thicknesses and it is completely vitrified. It will not, it will hold hydrogen. So I had all these discussions back then. And when you have tubes, you end up blowing high pressure through and you then blow out the uh, um, steel that's in there. Again, you could build precise segments of say a one, two, three, and then you, you, you would bin them if they didn't work. You know, what? Like, like you do with CPU cores but you would build them so that they completely and precisely weld together so that once you've got you know let's say we're going to build a 24 uh level four tour out of uh 24 level three tours then then you weld those together and and so you know maybe two of them don't come out of the print correctly it also makes it easier to print because these these direct laser metal sintering come out but i like the idea of plasma because if we can do it in plasma yeah um uh, it's going to maybe reorganize and fix some of the errors in our mass. You know what I'm saying? Is it, if we don't make yeah, right it's change, that, that was kind of an idea off. that it just kept coming back to me, and I don't know why it just kept popping into my head. Is you know, I was thinking almost uh, like a Tesla coil instead of the winding being copper or some other metal, if the winding was plasma, like in a Vega type discharge. Um, what the heck would we see there? And that was kind of the idea where that kind of came from, right? As as playing with some vinyl tubing and high voltage under evacuated pressures, um, the whole tubing would be glowing from one end to the other. Um, 
it doesn't last very long until it melts though. <laughs> <laughs> so you need something fairly high temperature. Ideally it would probably be quartz, obviously. Um, but I, I don't I know how the is, heck we can print cards. <laughs> well, you, you, well, you can print borosilica glass and you, you could run a low temperature plasma in there. We're not, yes. we're not necessarily yeah. looking at running this. Uh, just bring the temperature down, bring the pre uh, uh, gas pressure down and, and run it like Yeah, and, and I mean, if you had borosilicate, um, there's some really neat glass blowers out there too for simpler structures, right? Um, there's some people that are amazing, amazing. I, I could certainly imagine a, a coil of a coil. And then yeah, if you yeah. can join those up, then you're starting to get in towards a three tier. And we only need yeah. to, to, to yeah, and, start and... looking at the process. So I think I think really, I, I don't know whether anyone else agrees, but um, I think if we if we each know what left, left, right, right, whatever that we've done, and if we try and improve the overall symmetry and maybe find ways to improve the packing density that more closely matches nature, um, then, then we could, uh, you know, once once we have a good understanding of what works, whether it works or whether it doesn't work. I mean, what we've learned from that uh, internationally funded uh, um, petawatt dis uh, discharge, uh, sorry, laser pulse into uh, uh, nonlinear plasma is that at forty six microns you get a one tesla loop fit, uh, magnetic uh, uh, loop uh, current. Obviously, we're not we're not at forty six microns here. We're, we're at something that's you know hand size <laughs> or multiple hand size. So if it's working on the same principle, the 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 magnetic field may not. But they are only doing one pulse, and what we are looking at is resonantly coupling it. And so the other aspect of the question is, what is the mass that links the structure to the frequency you need to drive it in order to drive it resonantly? Okay, because Whatever it is, there's going to be a frequency that obviously needs to be uh, where the wavelength is bigger than the structure itself. We know that from the paper. Okay, It needs to be that so that the thing acts as a point. But then we need to know what frequency, and, and I'm not capable of doing the mass in there. There might be someone that's capable of doing the mass and saying, look, if we build a coil that looks like this, these are the parameter frequencies we need to look at. Now, it might be if we build a coil that is of a known structure, we can play with an audio amplifier or a frequency generator. And it, it, the thing that it falls apart in is the right one. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> That's the one. And, and also when you're looking at what I was just showing with uh, the work of uh, Shishkin et al, he's talking about micro leptons, these things that are so incredibly small that are composed of incredibly small subunits that you would need Tesla coils to be able to access the, the electromagnetic interaction with them. You understand what I just said in that previous presentation, we're talking about phenomenally small structures. You have the scales. Now, if you had an LC resonator that was at those scales, what frequency would you need to interact with it? And is that what, what is the important thing to create and energize these structures when they are uh, clustered onto a piece of metal and you want to energize them so that they get these loop energies bound within them so that they can start doing funky stuff with with matter okay those are some thoughts i just wanted to throw out right there uh, then david if you want to uh, talk about your experience and and where you think you're going to take it so with um i had a pretty crude winder that i just kind of threw together out of some stuff that i was getting ready to throw in the garbage actually and i just pipe strapped my handrail to a piece of wood that had a other 90 degree bracket on it um and ran it off the variac similar to what uh, hank was describing so then i could get you know just a few volts on it so that i had one rpm or one revolution per second or so in that range um and the problem i started seeing is that the mass of coil that had already come off and that was already spun off it had to keep turning right um so, or else it would start to kink and then it would unwind itself if you had too much of it laying around. So I just, I took a piece of plastic container from an old fish and bait, whatever, cut a hole in it and uh, put the coil down inside of that and stuck it on a piece of styrofoam and some water so that it had a really frictionless bearing surface and then start up the machine very slowly. And I was just using my hands to tension it and try and move it out each you know, it would only go for about a centimeter and a half, two centimeters, and then I'd have to kind of stop it or move it over with my hand at the same time. So it's a very laborious 
process. Um, I think it could be automated a lot better, but then when I saw what uh, Dave had made um, with the wire, where he was actually wrapping it around the core, um, that gave me some other ideas of we might be able to use something like 3D printer filament as the core in a similar machine. And that way you could actually take it and then wrap it with a heat gun around the next form and then you could use a heat and it would kind of keep it. But David, shape. of course, we are assuming yeah. that there was no uh, uh, ferromagnetic core in the center of the structure that the Gerberlis is describing. Of course. It yeah. might be the case that they did have a core at Maybe. each tier level. Yeah. I so, mean, I think if we know the if we know how it behaves with a uh, non-ferrous core, a non, you know, a, basically an air core or something that's very low loss, then I think we can look at where it goes from there. I think the first step for me will be to use an air core or PLA or some other type of printer filament. I'm, I'm seriously looking into that as the next iteration. Um, I think we need to explore both. I think we need to have uh, yep. non, non ferromagnetic cores. I think we need to have paramagnetic cores. I think we have diamagnetic cores. And we, are, you know, we need to have the whole spread yes. spectrum to, 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 to separate out what's doing what. Um, yeah, the, the other the other thing that I found is this is kind of something I was trying to wind on. a This is a 3D printed donut form. I printed it in four sections um, and I was trying to wrap the sub coil. I had it around rope and it, it seems like it's just so floppy and very hard to kind of control. You know, obviously, this like how it stays on there without gaps and the symmetry keeps breaking. So I was actually thinking maybe instead of a rope. And maybe instead of a continuous coil, I had figured out that based on these without having them pinched, um, I should be able to have 27 segments around it. So what I was thinking is maybe I should 3D print some very, you know, the smaller donut cores for the level down from this and do individual 27 coils and then wire them together around it. Because I could probably achieve a much better symmetry that way. So, so I think that's what I'm going to try next to so, print so smaller ones. What I've, what I've thought about is lo looking at what David Watson has done, and he can talk about what he's done in a little while. He has wound his initial thing around some form of metal, I believe, and he can talk about that in a minute. The initial wire is very, very fine. And you're right, he's wound it around uh, by taking the, the spool and moving the spool around. So you get around the complication that you have, which is a fantastic innovation. OK, and then he's pulling that other spoil through uh, to put it onto another spool. spool. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the video is there and, and we'll provide links in, yeah. in the, the remote view afterwards. So so that that's a great innovation. The other innovation that I think he's done that we can utilize is he is putting the that level of tour. He's but then rotating that around some uh, um, uh, polyethylene uh, sort of uh, fish pump type tubing. Now. Hear me out. If we know the diameter of that structure, right, that's around that polyethylene tubing, I can 3D print a torus that has flat dividers coming out annular, right, that yep. squash the polymer. So we end up by having these highly densely packed structures specifically between the gaps and the wire on that lower level is, is forced into a shape that's more close to the natural structure. So, and, and then what I would do is I'd, I'd have it split it down the bottom or I'd, I'd have a key weight so that you can, you have it open. So you're not having to wind it through. You can literally wind it around. There's always a gap at the bottom. And then there's a little yeah. thing that you insert at the end, which locks the two input and output wires. Yes. Right. Yeah. And, and that's, I was thinking the similar concept of having like a tray, but the ones I was thinking of wouldn't have been pinched. Um, but that yeah, brings I up think, a I point think what where... David has done allows for this pinching and allows for this location so that we can get the packing density up. And, and it's, I think a number of iterations with the 3D print would, would enable that. And I can see uh, some of the Stuart has got a coil that he's built there. So um, uh, I, I like his experience in a minute. So um David, go on if you've got th some other things that you want to say. Otherwise, I would like yeah, to... Yeah, there's a couple couple things here. One thing I wanted to kind of discuss with everyone was in the higher level EV structure, so you got donuts into a string, which is in a bigger donut. Each one of them individually, um, it, it's an individual torus, 
So it's not a continuous winding all the way around. So I was just kind of, I was wondering, like, does it, it really matter? In nature, you have... in nature that's what Yeah, it's like doing. the natural, reality, ball, like the yeah. structure that you've uh, derived that you thought mm -hmm. where it's a three-level tour coming up to another three-level tour, another one, another one, and then they go around and do a donut. But those are individually, they're rotating on themselves. They're mm -hmm. individual units. They're mm -hmm. not linked to the next one the next one so right. if we were to segment this as three level tours print it construct it separately and then like you said maybe even pinched into forms and then all the way around the donut that's a much neater construction technique than a continuous winding is very difficult to get the symmetries right here and, and so that was that was the main it, thing i want yeah and yeah. you could also so you can wire it in series or parallel yeah as well, yeah right? exactly yeah. you got flexibility yeah and you can also just have three or four or five or six or seven. Yeah, yeah you can experiment you can with the it numbers. Makes any difference to have yes. 24. We've not yes. seen more than 48. Uh, I would suggest that it, when you look at um, what Lawrence Livermore are doing with, with uh, Focus Fusion, that they have, um, I think it's 16 uh, gliding arcs coming down to make their so-called plasmoid. I believe each of those will produce counter-rotating vortex. So you have 32 coming together, but each one actually only makes one for us but it's still only building level two tori. And of course, they're looking for that to collapse and do a bit of fusion with the boron and the proton. This isn't something that they, you're building that is able to build and eat matter and eat matter, which is what happens with the Hutchison effect and then Lena. And it certainly happened, in my view, with the uh, Pons and Fleischmann 1cc Palladium ball lightning event uh, in the mid-1980s. Okay, so... Um, yeah, I think what you're suggesting is, is a good idea. I think if we can modularize it in any way, whether it is the plasma iteration or, or the, the wire-based iteration, um, this makes it much more, and, and if we can create the same notional effect with a small number of small units, like it, it can be something that fits in the palm of your hand and, and does the demonstration, then that's really valuable. Um, uh, so, okay. You know, we're not going to succeed until we do. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of failure. Um, but what we have is we have a very serious research program, for whatever reason, was never published. And we don't know why they were doing it and what their end goal was. But we have a very serious peer-reviewed document in 1995. And, by an even, and then it was studied mathematically by an even more serious top-level Soviet uh, mathematician physicist at the top level, top of his game. And in a peer-reviewed journal, Electricity, the main electricity journal of the Soviet Union. In fact, well before then, it was from 1880. So these are not joke players. And they felt it important enough to risk them having something coming down because it was classified research. Both of them thought it was important enough to, to, to share it forward so that it was there for us. There's definitely something behind this. So um, I think it's going to take some guts, some ingenuity, and you're the right guys to do it. <laughs> um, so if, if you haven't got anything more to say, I'm going to move on to David Watson. And then I think so, some of the Stuart is, is waving some things around. And I'm already getting excited with what he's waving around. So, so we'll, we'll have a look at what he's got. I'm going to add, add Ken Pratt in. We've got another guy uh, wanting to join us. OK, so David, can you share your experience and uh, where you see what your work's going on? I know we've discussed it already, but... Um, uh, how you yeah, hi, hi, Bob. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yeah, um, yeah, it, it's pretty early days here. Um, I only completed the uh super tour last night, and um, I've done two experiments or carried out two experiments today. And it's a bit really too early to conclude anything, it's 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 got me baffled a bit because I'm getting the, the magnetic field as you'd expect from from a tor toroid configuration. But when, it, when it's powered down, the magnetic field collapses, but the electric field remains. And I've physically switched off the power amplifier and also disconnected the wires. So the coil is standing alone and there's the electric field there. So and you it's got have me a puzzle. And you have, uh, so your configuration is left, right, right, right? No, it's it's right. On the, on the first winding, I actually put it on some ferrous-based uh, wire simply because I thought the first one would 
just be acting like an electromagnet solenoid, a continuous uh, based field, if you like, to support the others. So I thought it would give them really matter on the on on one. Uh, so plus it was easy to do. But since, since then, I have got some more cores. I've got some uh, plastic cores, nylon and aluminium, different cores to try. So you've got a non-magnetic, a paramagnetic, and a magnetic. Yeah. So I think you're in a perfect position to find out whether there's a difference between what you think you're already seeing and what might occur if you use one of the other materials. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That. That's the plan. And because uh, you're a, you've got a one, two, three, four tour, um, it should yeah. be an electric field that it's producing. Because the magnetic field yeah. will be trapped. It's not that it's disappeared. It, what I what I how I see it is it's the leakage magnetic field when you're when you're powering it and and when you take that you you power it down you're just you're the the, the magnetic field that is held there is, is not able to leak because it's trapped so you're just yeah, the electric I'd, field. yeah quite quite possibly um like I say it's got me a bit baffled at the moment but I'm fascinated by this I'm really <laughs> interested to know what is going on i need to eliminate some things i put, I put an amplified um signal detector on the wall and i'm getting background 50 hertz but i tried the experiment this evening here at 30 hertz and it's exactly the same power okay, level can just describe the entire experiment so bef can you say what the state was that you found it in before you powered it up then what it yeah, was afterwards, yeah. then what it was when you put, took the power off, and then what it was after a period of time. You had a couple of experiences. Can you share that with the group? Yeah, on um, both experiments, I got it to the 50 hertz this morning um, before I went out was um, absolutely zero on everything, as you'd expect. Zero. So, so just to clarify, this is when you are looking for electric and magnetic field when it's not powered up, you were not able to observe any field uh, uh, around the coil. So that, what, what yeah. that suggests is yeah. that uh, you have all of your equipment around and all of your mains uh, equipment, and they're all at yeah. 50 hertz, and you weren't able to pick up anything. Now, just to clarify, I had a conversation with David earlier today, and he thought the Jeverbless paper was using 50 hertz. So he chose 50 hertz. In fact, what the Jeverbless paper was saying is they used 30 hertz because they didn't want to yeah. use... A 50 hertz or any harmonic of it uh, because they didn't want to be accused of any induction but what you're saying is that before you powered on you observed no electric field no magnetic field and then what happened yeah it's absolutely zero and powered up on the 50 and the magnetic field electric fields um, created uh, probably about a meter tall i guess or just under a meter uh, exactly as you'd expect from uh, from a concentric field um, type arrangement. And uh, that was fine. So switch, switched off, physically switched off the power amp and the magnetic field dropped um, off the detectors, detector. And, but the electric field was still there. So I pulled out the wires from the power supply um, of power amp and um, the electric field remained. And the, this was, I think it was about five to one I did the experiment. But, um, and I kept an eye on it and the field was still there. And I checked every quarter of an hour and two o'clock it was still there. And I, I was sort of getting, well, I, I, I just couldn't work it out and because there was no, absolutely no field there whatsoever. And then I tried again at quarter past two and it had gone back to absolutely zero all on its own. And I don't know why. <laughs> Nothing so something had had happened and it just collapsed. Yeah, it just collapsed. It didn't fall down in strength. It just went from oh. whatever it was, <laughs> two or three hundred or ninety, whatever the figure was, uh, it went to zero. And I uh, balanced the meter in the same position. Um, so it could just. Well, it was zero everywhere. It just went straight down to zero. And, uh, wow. <laughs> I, I, and you, uh, you've repeated the experiment now. So you, you described that something else happened. You you felt you might have knocked it off the table, with, a bit like... Yeah, well, well what, it's, it's a bit silly. It's at the kitchen table, because uh, 
um, I haven't got my workshop at the moment. Um, um, mm -hmm. So I, I was doing this mm -hmm. uh, on the kitchen table and uh, it was lunchtime and uh, I moved the chairs <laughs> out the way and, and cleared and cleared the armchair. And uh, I, it's possible I might have knocked the field off the table if, if that physically possible I, I don't know it was just it was just reading the bagel game i mean what i was doing is disturbing the area basically so moving things around and i mean it's possible uh, but i don't I mean, know the I, obvious I, thing I, to try is if you believe you are witnessing this and it's locked into space time with all of the relative movements of the, the planet the sun the moon our galaxy yeah. relative to other galaxies so it people think oh this shouldn't stay there but when you're in a car you don't fly out the window do you <laughs> you move with no. it with all the relative movements once that inertial uh, situation is set up and it's all pushed around by the the same locked in forces so it well, would be interesting it, it, exactly move, yeah this, this is this is why it's interesting to me and i sort of bumped into this group i think it was after your uh, appearance on apex because uh, i'm interested in um uh power for mm -hmm. spacecraft and, mm -hmm. and flux locking is one of the things so if i can lock an electric field then that that's super relevant to um some other a lot. <laughs> projects a lot <laughs> so so it's interesting but but yeah the thing, it went away the the field after I don't know, there was an hour or two or two but anyway that one went away but i i repeated the experiment this evening and i got back and uh, at 30 hertz same thing again magnetic field an electric field it was it didn't appear quite as strong at 30 hertz but then again you haven't got quite as much power going in plus plus i did tune down the the power amp just to shade because it was starting to clip and when i left it the field was still there on the kitchen table. <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to I do just, the experiment. Um, you've got to do the experiment where you lift the coil away and try and leave the field in place. I know that's the next one. I mean, if it's still there after this, if the field is still there, I'll take the coil away and see. But, but I wanted to sort of tune <laughs> I, I would in. get a bit freaked out if I saw that. I just would. I know, so would I. <laughs> but I'll let you know tomorrow. Well, so, if, yeah. if it's possible, it would be fantastic if you have a a modern phone or even an old phone that they allow for uh, um, stop motion. So it would be great if you could put your field detector, power it up uh, and capture in frame the power being turned off or whatever, and then just leave it there monitoring the field um, on like maybe one one sample every five seconds or something. Yeah, um, I actually took uh, two videos this after, well, this evening because I, I found uh, an old GoPro type camera. Oh, awesome! And plugged, because they're perfect um, for this. And plugged it in, so that ran the whole time, and it might even still be running now. But I reckon the battery's gone because I haven't plugged it from the mains. Um, which, which type of GoPro is it? Because some of them you can get a, like a, a USB three and power them permanently. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what it was being powered by. But when I powered everything off to to join the oh. meeting, I, I switched everything off. <laughs> all right well it's early days but i, I you know I, i'm just surprised if you have managed to achieve it so soon i'm surprised it was this easy <laughs> but if if it is this I, easy, I, I, it's not that you, you you've done a fantastic job and, and it look can i can you describe like it looks like you've got some stepper motors in there and, and you've got some sort of basic control for for doing stuff how did you achieve your winding well that that was um that was my background in engineering. It's called poke and hope. You <laughs> set it all up and you just hope it works and adjust things so you get the tension right and the hope that every time it wraps around, the coil laying beside the one it's aside just is enough to pull it along on the right tension to the spooler. But I've, I've, I did actually, uh, by adjusting the speed of the spooler, you can, you can adjust the pitch of, of the... Uh, of the winding so i'm making another one at the moment um the next experiment um but that they're much tighter together 
And and can, can you tell me because actually when Hank saw your coil, he didn't realize that I think that the first the first level coil was a coil. He just thought it was a wire. So he said it's a yeah, three level. Coil. No, it's it, it's quite small. It's 0. 0.8 millimeter diameter. So can I can I ask coil. how many loops in the original solenoid you've got on, on that first level coil? Or second it's level over twenty two thousand. No, not on the whole structure, but I mean on on the, the like you've got the the core, the the ferrous based core. Yeah, yeah. How many in one of the loops of that have you got the the sub loops around it? I don't know, but I can, I can count them. Yeah, I mean, I, I was trying to do it. <laughs> I, it's not quite high yeah, enough resolution I don't know. for the images you shared. I no, I I, don't, I didn't count them. No, but but I do I do I do um, know that when I first set up the final um layer there was 26 so i i, I think i ended up well it fitted 26 but i think i i um untwisted one uh or when i when i joined them to try and get 24 so i think it's a 24 segment so the the the, the, the bigger level the, the yeah the top level is 24 the, level but the other one the other ones i didn't count yeah so. But I, I can count them. But I think it's great. And if you can go for a finer pitch, you're going to end up with a very, very strong solenoid, which in my view, yeah. closer to uh, how nature is building it. Because in nature, it's a superfluid. So it's superconducting stuff. It's, there, is, it's, there, there is no coils. It's just oil coils, if you know what I mean. <laughs> well, so, yeah, yeah. I, know. Um, I mean, I can put a finer core in there and the finer wire. There are finer wires. I, 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 I think a... you'll end up with it snapping and you'll be gutted. I think what you're doing is well, that is work. that is the risk. Yeah. 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 So I, I think what you're doing is is great. If it's it seems to be repeatable, you seem to be able. To... So so how long does it take to produce the coil that you've had, and how much personal intervention do you have to have? Um, good question. Um, it it took about two days in total but but of, i i um have quite a busy week so I, I i switch it on when i'm there uh, when i'm here and um i, I, I don't know the, what the, the problem was is the um cam belt or the timing belt comes off or it did, did break once but, but a bit of evo stick i <laughs> <laughs> fix that uh, there's, there's nothing major you know it's, it's but so this, just... this is something that you know if if you if you've achieved it and it doesn't seem like you need to take the engineering much farther than just making it look pretty um no you could no. actually knock out these quite quickly i think so yeah you probably knock out um one every two days i reckon yeah if, oh. if i was here just because i wouldn't like to sort of leave it alone on its own but what i have done is i haven't tightened up the the flanges at the end and they rattle and that's quite good because when i'm in the other room which is like um more of a workshop area i can sort of get on with things and i can hear it rattling like a little cow bell in the distance <laughs> so, so i know it as long as i hear it going round, i know it's working so i've worked that one out so well, that, that's it's been a bit of a busy week, but I should oh, be able no. to do more next week. All right, so um, we'll go to thank thank you. We'll go to uh, yeah. some some of the Stuart now, and if if people have got questions, please use the uh, uh, reactions raise hand. And after the four people that have made coils, uh, and if there's anyone else that's made coils, let me know. Um, uh, then then it, it will open the floor up to everyone to uh, ask questions of the people that make coils because you've probably got a lot of things that you want to ask okay so uh, summer are you willing to take us through what you've got there and do you want to go full screen yeah am i am i full screen or you're not full screen well, can you hear me? me so let, let I, I actually i don't know how to do this maybe i can go uh there's probably some way i can make you go full screen uh, let me go here and go uh, spotlight for everyone. There we go. All right, you're full screen now. Okay, can you hear me? Um, so I started shooting last week. 
and I uh, there's 47 per loop on this, and then seven loops, and then another seven loops or eight loops. And so this one's nine. But uh, okay, we're we, sorry. This is what I get. Oh, we're not sorry. We're not seeing your video uh, at the moment doing anything. So it might be that there's too much bandwidth. From, so if everyone can kill their their video just for now, and just in case it's it's overall streaming video. Okay. And if you if you can kill the feeds from everyone else so that you're just outputting video because we, we're seeing a whole bunch of things on your video but not not able to see it moving. <laughs> okay, do you want to try again, Stuart? Uh, yeah. Bob, uh, is it moving now? No, we've just got a still. Maybe, maybe that's something I've done. I don't know. I, um, let me just see. It's not your 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 image is frozen. We've got a bunch of coils on the screen. It says Stuart bandwidth yeah. is low. Is there any way you can increase your bandwidth or come in on a different connection? Like maybe if you've got a phone connection, that might be better. Okay, I think that's not working and and uh if you're talking um peter we're not hearing you so okay okay no i'm not talking oh, okay all right okay so it's let me let me see what's going on here okay uh Okay, I'm going to take your spotlight. It's not really uh, working, Stuart. Yep. Um, okay. I don't know how to remove spotlight, guys. Sorry. <laughs> okay, may, maybe, um, Stuart, if you can pause, maybe if you can find a better connection, that would be great. Um, and I'm going to go to questions now, unless someone else has something uh, that they want to show. So I think at first is uh, Mr. Stephen B. Halls. If he wants to ask a question, please address the person you're speaking to. Um, and and uh, okay, can you hear me? Stuart can come back in a minute. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, so I'm just a couple things to show to people that are fun. There's this group called Tensor Technology, Tensor Rings on Facebook. And uh, it's hard to see this picture, but he's made a coil just out of copper. He's put a crystal in the center of it. He's put it on a plate and the plate is above some water and he put the water in the freezer, put some blue dye in there. A ball of blue dye was attracted to below the coil and did not freeze. And then below that, you can see these uh, radiating lines of gas formation in the ice. I thought that was kind of a cool, fun thing to do for people. And then the other thought I wanted to share was just about how you could take uh, cubic magnets like this and make them into a long line, then bend that into a circle and fill up the wedges with iron filings or something, and then build multiple levels of that sort of thing as an alternative way to get magnetic energy to flow in circles. And this is from a, a Facebook group called Magnetic Games. He also shows a really nice recipe for making your own uh, supercell uh, things that show these magnetic field lines, mixing WD-40 and um, ferrofluid. So that's my comments. Over to you, Bob. Stephen, I think that's a great comment with making a, your own ferrofluid. So if you can copy that into the uh, remote view as a comment to the link there, because um, I, I was thinking you, I, I have some uh, magnetic viewing paper here. Um, this this stuff, which is, I think it's actually a zinc compound in there. So uh, I don't know if I, I'm not showing my mugshot here. Um, it's th this stuff. Uh, it's uh, called MagnaView. Um, and you just put it over a magnet, which I've got some around, but everyone's everyone's seen these, I think so. Um, but the 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 uh, ferrofluid type uh, solutions, uh, the, the particles in there align 
and um, then the LEDs uh, being reflected down the lines uh, give you a much better idea of the, the uh, uh, field uh, shape. And something like that, being able to put it over a quill uh, would give people an idea of maybe what's going on. There might, we might see something really rather funky. Um, actually, um, a fractal woman in Canada, one of your com comrades or your, your countrymen there, um, I think she's Canadian, uh, she's, she's going to try and work out in maths what's going on and, and make a simulation. <clears throat> and I think this might be very useful. Uh, she simulated the uh, Le Pont Bowl um successfully and she believes that she'll be able to simulate this so i think think we're going to have some good math support from from her and that might inform us to design moving forward um okay so uh is that um you, what you wanted to say stephen okay so uh peter if you want to ask a question uh i i was going to suggest uh, uh two things um and and you actually touched on the first one uh, right ahead of me, namely that um, uh, simulation uh, might be extremely good here because uh, uh, simulation will produce uh, so many more experiments as to what the field structure uh, is uh, going to uh, do, except uh, you know by uh, you know physically trying to wind it. Uh, I mean, it's going to be days uh, between uh, the various experiments. So, so that was one comment. The other comment I have, and, and this comes from um, uh, being trained in, in uh, electricity uh, an extremely long time ago and never having worked at it, uh, but having uh, you know, an intuitive um, understanding. I am not sure that the... Um, uh, that these coils have to be particularly uh, beautiful, regular, etc. Because I think that the uh, uh, the field, particularly at the uh, the kind of frequencies that we're dealing with here, uh, I mean the frequencies are essentially direct current. Uh, um, as long as uh, you know we're below a, a megahertz, uh, it, it's essentially direct current uh, in in these dimensions. Um, then uh, I believe that the uh, the field will actually uh, produce the symmetry um, uh, that that is uh, that we're looking for. Uh, and uh, as a follow on to that, I think. Uh, the coils could most likely be uh, constructed from segments that you uh, solder together, that you, you connect the individual segments together. That's probably going to work just as well as a continuous coil because uh, uh, the connection is not going to disturb the, uh, uh, the current at these frequencies. That, that's good points and I mean that 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 is um obviously that's the approach that uh, Hank Urian has taken and the approach that is being suggested uh, by David Bitlier. Um okay. so and, and it would be the only practical way to additively manufacture these or 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 make in my view a plasma channel version of it mm -hmm. um, but it, yeah to a certain degree these if you actually look at these structures, that are in the Vega Valley, the, these frozen structures, you know, they, they're definitely Taurus of Tauri, but, um, you know, some of them have landed and in, in, as they, the fields have collapsed, they've gone a bit wonky. Now, I imagine that when they were flying around and uh, uh, fully self-organized, they, they were nice and beautiful. Um, they, they, they were probably perfect. Uh, yeah, that, when, when I'm, they, I'm pretty certain they were absolutely perfect. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because there is probably a, a, an equilibrium there uh, uh, where nature finds itself. Uh, and then uh, there is another hunch here, and, and this is that what we're looking at here uh, could well be what. Um, uh, is under the uh, cover of uh, the ECAT. It, yes, uh, it could be. Um, and, but, you know, 
it, my, my view on these things, if you didn't say it, you didn't do it. You, you just, you're claiming no, no, credit off the back. Uh, 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 but uh, and, and I base my, uh, my, my um, uh, connection there on, on the fact that uh, Rossi has been trying hard to modulate the frequency to get uh, his device to, uh, uh, to work. And, and, uh, uh, and the frequency probably has something to do with the physical characteristics of, of the individual unit. I, well, the, 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 when, when um, uh, the initial flurry of attempts to uh, do the, uh, the uh, high uh, intensity discharge experiments to try and create ball lightning in there, uh, one chap, and, and I need to share the videos, he put one, uh, a, a coil around the tube and was able to use RF to pre-ionize the gas such that he could use a lot lower excitation to create a ball inside, uh, I think it was a neon tube or something, uh, maybe it was yep. a heavy tube. Um, I suspect that if we have um, a, a head tube and we have one of these coils around, it will be a self-focusing structure. And that's why I think it's important to have these magnetic field understandings um, that was brought up by Stephen uh, B. Halls, uh, because if we can find that it is, it is focusing on a point, then we put the, 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 um, the head with that point in between the discharge, and we might be able to force the location of, of the ball lightning into that position. And, mm -hmm. and actually uh, another ele uh, uh, electrical expert has produced a uh, ball lightning which is blue in a neon tube um, using a different <laughs> method. So, so bo both of these uh, videos I will share, but I think if we add those two pieces of learning, the one that did it by stimulation and, and frequency in order to create the blue in, in, in a neon tube, and the other one that managed to lower the input energy to the discharge <clears throat> using pre-ionization, which he, he basically uh, added Paul Collock's work uh, on trying to create ball lightning by pre-ionizing the gas to what was being suggested uh, for the HID in, in the xenon tubes. And I think if we bring in these coils, and personally, I think if we add a source of ionization, so I, I haven't discussed this in depth, but if you go and look at what PAP did for his uh, PAP engine, when he was doing his tests, he used a cathode ray tube. He actually went out and bought old oscilloscopes and, and uh, old televisions, and he bored holes through the outside, put his gas mixture in and used the cathode ray tube to treat his gases. What was he doing? He was 100% without any doubt now creating charge clusters. And that was to test the process. In the actual embodiments, he used radioactive material in two pills to create the charge clusters in situ. He then used the, the magnetic field pulse that's created by a discharge to blow up the clusters. That is free energy captured from the vacuum, as well as the gain that I showed you in the previous presentation to this, where you put five to 10 AB in and you get yep. electrons that are coming out at five to 10 kilo electron volts. So you, you're getting a thousand fold gain, which is the same as is claimed by Ken Shoulders in one of his early 2000s uh, things. So um, you, you, you're basically having that gain. And then as the, uh, he had a, the cylinder head was a torus shape. And that created a torus that went up, which was able to push the cylinder up. And because it was a torus of these electrons that were released, you had a magnetohydrodynamic effect and he had a coil on the outside to collect the electricity that was generated and he dumped that in resistors and he wasn't so concerned about the kilowatts of electricity that's been generated every single pulse. So we, have, we already have the method to generate direct mechanical energy and direct um, uh, uh, electrical. electrical energy and we know precisely how it's happening now we know it all the way down to the substructural level uh, and we also and i've already described in the monopole clutch video the failure mode which was caused by Feynman the there was a drain to uh, very thin wire going into the, the mains and i believe it was only connected to the ground and this was to prevent charge clusters building up because the failure mode was the cylinder head cracked just like a Hutchison piece of steel and out came in, in Feynman's own account, a silvery metal blob that then turned into a puff of smoke. And I believe that may have been, if it was an aluminium uh, piston, 
then that would have been instantly, it would have been liquid, or liquid with the level of clusters in there, uh, or not liquid, but in the, a non-solid structure. And then it would have rapidly oxidized and created aluminium oxides. Everything's accounted for by uh, uh, Feynman's own, uh, own uh, um, uh, documentation of the event. And, and so it is charged clusters. Uh, that His method of creating them is the way. So, and when you look at this, and I was going to talk about this in a different presentation, but I'm going to throw it in right now. Um, he, what, what Shishkin has made public uh, in his 2014 patent is that phosphors with this PN aspect to them uh, is, in fact, one of his solutions is zinc sulfide. And zinc sulfide is phosphor on a CRT uh, screen. And I have a video that I recorded earlier this week with my cathode ray tube in my house, uh, with me sparking the, the, the static electricity on the front of the screen uh, uh, after I turned on the television. And you know that charge clusters are being built up in that tube. They're hitting, they're hitting the, uh, 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 the phosphor. The phosphor is partially disassembling them and you're getting stat up, static built up on the front. So a lot of weird phenomena in the past is going to become clear. And to that end, I, I believe that by putting something like this sand into a tube, you can pre-ionize the air, as is already clearly stated and free to use in the 1973 patent of Paul Collock. The model of his ball lightning, in my view, is incorrect. Uh, and, and it's the same, not, not quite as incorrect as the plasmoid, but we, we now, in my view, know what it is. So we can pre-ionize the air, not with uh, electrically powered stuff, but with sand taken off a beach. <laughs> and yep. we know this works because John Hutchinson used uranite in his experiments. And, and we know it's because that is the laser pulses going on. So with, with that said, I, I think we can use the combination of these technologies to produce, I, I believe that if, if we work together at, as a group, we, we can develop self-sustaining like uh, you know I'd, I'd like to see one of the first objects just a light bulb that just works it just works it just you turn it on and it just works <laughs> uh, uh, 100 watt light bulb that also uh, outputs 100 watts yeah, uh, yeah 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 but but, but you know if, if if you every one of these decays even the weak decays in here are 360 kilo electron volts like for, from one of the decays in here and that yeah. only you only need 5 ev to, oh. to create one of these uh, MTEX, these exotic vacuum objects. Uh, and so the, the potential for energy or car harnessing and, and gain, what, what, what am I seeing here? <laughs> so, what, what am I being shown? Who, who's uh, showing us some video here? Yeah, Don, we're, we're seeing your screen, buddy. You might wanna- You, you might wanna not share that. Yeah. <laughs> Did you wanna show something? Is this, is this, I don't know if you can hear yeah, us. I'm on, a, I'm on a phone, so it's oh. a little tricky. But yeah, I was oh, gonna show okay. you. Okay, so Diadon, do, do you wanna come in now because you, you, you've got your hand up? Yeah, I was just gonna <clears throat> first ask a question about the, the coil set, right? And the super tour coil set. Is the purpose to focus into like a, sing, like a single point um, for a discharge event, like in a, in a gaseous medium or or is it to just create a field that can be that can be monitored and hopefully sustaining? Is that, is that the purpose? So I, I don't think there's any particular purpose other than to find out whether we can have a self-sustaining ma magnetic or electric field as per the claims of the, the um, uh, Zverblis and, and Nevesky uh, based on, on that classified energetics research. My view is that if you look at what Henk has done, and I, I believe uh, uh, also what, what David has done, uh, Cosmic Dave, <clears throat> he has um, uh, been able to show that the field is a fall off, which implies that the field is strongest at the center. And I think maybe um, Hank can step in here and, and suggest that it, it is the case that the field is strongest at the center. That's what I certainly saw. And if that's the case, that's where I would do one of a number of things. One would be to try and uh, uh, accelerate the, the the beta decay or alpha or gamma decay of samples. And I've suggested to Hank, once we've got a coil that is suitable, uh, we can strap the scintillator together like, you know, here with this 
material and put it into the coil and see if we get an increased uh, gamma or beta or alpha emissions. Uh, and that would be interesting in its own right because this would be a method for radiation remediation. But also it, would, it might be possible to uh, produce light bulbs that just work. And, yeah. and other energy generators. So Ken, can you talk about the field? Yeah, the field in the center is indeed the strongest. Um, I've published this, uh, this picture um, and you can see it that it goes from about 17 centi 70 centimeters up. It's about one milli gauss on, of, of strength. And then when I go to the center, it goes up to 100. So um, then the field in the center is a little strange, but it's like constant. So it's, it's going indeed like uh, in, from 70 centimeters up, it's, 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 it's not linear, like nature mm -hmm. is not linear. Uh, it's, it's, I don't know how, how this, the scale works. I've, I've published this, uh, this photo, you can say, this, this, this picture of this, uh, these levels. But um, in the center, it's high. And, and around the coil itself, it is not, not clear yet for me. Uh, the overall structure seems to be like a, a big ball. Uh, so I went take the, the one Gauss, the milli Gauss level. It it seems to be. I have to make a, a, a perfect ball, um, perfect measurement. I've measured only one quarter of a circle, uh, one quadrant. Uh, I like to, to turn it over and do the other half. Sorry. You need to turn it over and do the other half to see if the field shape is significantly different. Exactly, exactly. And uh, but then uh, around the coil itself. Uh, it, it's difficult because my uh, TR2 is, is only going up to one uh, 100 milligauss. So it, it's not, uh, and then it goes um, out of uh, out of range. Uh, out, out of range. Yeah, so so that's difficult to, to measure. So probably I have to turn down the power and uh, and, and do a, uh, another. Well, I think the, the, I think the key takeaway is it would appear to be focused in the center. That's intuitively where. Yeah, absolutely true. Absolutely yeah. true. That's that's the first thing I saw, and and it goes log logarithmic, uh, logarithmic, uh, or something like that. I don't know. I I, I can I I've I've, sure, I've I've sent you the picture so you can. Yeah, I'm going to try and colorize those and and, um, and work but out it, the scale. It, on one uh, seventy centimeter is one milli gauss, and in the center it's up to hundred. Okay, so, so I just want to, um, add, I want to add two points onto that because so people can contextualize why this is important. The, the, the first is that in the, the PAP engine, if you go and read the book by uh, um, Stoyan Sarkachev on his understanding of the PAP engine, you'll see quite a few things align with what I've just told you. But secondly, he had a linear magnetic field in the area where he was building the charge clusters. He doesn't refer to them in that way. Uh, before the discharge occurs, which means that all of these clusters, uh, which uh, at the magnetic level will align in the same orientation, which means uh, they will then be able to aggregate better and then the blowing up will be uh, bigger, as it were. So um, I think that, uh, that that's one aspect. And then John Hutchison guided the uh, uh, the structures towards his metal samples using magnets and and traveling wave tubes, and so um, uh, when you when you one one will be doing electric one 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 will be doing magnetic, and we already know from uh, the work of Keith Fredericks and from uh, our observations with uh, in two thousand seventeen with the echo fuel that these can be guided by magnets, and it's specifically said by Shishkin in the presentation that I just gave before this session. Um, that depending on the state of the LC you, you, and it, how it's expressed on the outside, uh, it will behave differently in magnetic fields. And you can see this in the work of, of uh, uh, um, Keith Fredericks as well, but uh, particularly from the ones that he emitted from his fingers onto X-ray film. So I think, I think uh, uh, if we are focusing the clusters into the center point, 
I believe that's where we are most likely to create the ball, ball lightning structure. And once we've got the ball lightning structure, if we can use this coil to contain the ball lightning in a way that it's not interacting with any dense matter, we can then control its intensity by feeding electrons in from the outside, and then it will do the business in terms of uh, producing extra energy or, or transmutations or, or, or whatever. But we need have to- you... Sorry? No, my apologies, I didn't mean to interrupt. So you, you just need to keep it away from any, any dense matter, uh, and you need to keep it from falling apart and throwing out sub subunits of itself that will go away and, and, and eat away at your containment. Um, so these, these are things that you, you need to do. So, um, uh, Dayden, do you have any other questions? Uh, I have uh, two, actually, now like, that you've brought that up is, um, have you looked into uh, inductive, like just inductive coils, uh, water-cooled inductive coils using like a ZVS or whatever? Um, if you do like a, a, a magnetic field uh, switch in the, the wiring, the, so uh, the coil goes, clockwise and then switches counterclockwise you can actually you have a uh, entrapment in that coil set have you ever seen that demonstration or or know what i'm talking about Do you mean when you have a counterwound one where you you get these it's counterwound and so and it, it, it'll wind induct wind like a ferromagnetic the other way yeah yeah and it, it will it'll create a standing node in between the two coils so and this, it'll hold it'll hold a uh, a ball of of like um of hot metal there, you know, it can hold a hold of ball, hot metal there. So are you implying something similar to that with, with uh, a well, coil? What I'm like going to tell you now has been said before, but maybe it wasn't clear to people. The copper winding that the lion author did that surrounded the central uh, um, core of the lion reactors, it was principally to fill the gap between the ceramic and the, the other ceramic, silicon dioxide and, and alumina, ceramic as thermal conduction. But it was a copper wire that went up and very deliberately came down the other way, exactly as you've described. So it may be partly to due to that, the way that the Lion reactor was successful in terms of producing all, all of the effects of a quantum coherent nuclear reactor. Um, because it made those standing waves in the- Because it would make, and not only that, you had, and, and Alan Goldwater highlighted this first, it had a very low number of turns on the outside solenoid which was the heating solenoid. But the unpleasantly bad, cheap uh, uh, power supply that was I was not allowed to turn on because it was bought off uh, eBay uh, when I was at Aarhus University. They said, we can't run an experiment with equipment bought on eBay. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, this equipment's so much better than people had in the 1910s. What's the problem? <laughs> anyway, uh, it produced a 20 or so kilohertz ripple on it. So even when you powered it off, uh, it was still producing this, this ripple AC uh, 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 overlaid onto the, the DC. And, and so if you had, let's say it's a 22 kilohertz ripple, and that was on um, uh, this very low nut, nut, uh, winding, uh, then you had a secondary, which is this very high number of copper, you might have had a, a much, much higher frequency being produced because in the center of this, Although it's it's concentric, uh, uh, the lion author put, put, put an iron bolt. And so it had an iron core, uh, in, then with all of these copper, with a counterwound copper around the outside, then the quartz, and then the low number of turns of the Cantal wire. And I think the configuration could have taken that bad power supply, because when we tried to replicate it in California, the first thing Alan Goldwater did was let's get rid of the bad power supply and put a very nice lab one on. And we didn't see anything. <laughs> and put a stainless steel thermocouple in. We, so we removed the iron core and took away the ripple. <laughs> so like all of the magnetics went out of the equation. And of course, everything you're seeing is something that looks like it has some sort of relationship to magnetism. So it's not surprising. Also, we thought that the actual temperature of 830 to 850 was the actual temperature. It's offset. Uh, the actual peak temperature was 1030 degrees C, and we'd never done a replication since. So um, there was three major components where we failed because we didn't recognize key parameters and the, i think now we can all accept that magnetism is playing such a huge role in all these systems we can already re guarantee it didn't work because of that a reason so uh so so there we go so yeah i think the counter, counter winding coil is interesting and, and maybe 
depending on whether you're going left, 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 or left, right, left, 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 or so I whatever the combination, maybe some configuration of that. So for instance, with with uh, Cosmic Dave, he is is doing I think right, left, 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 or left, right, 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 one of those. So maybe that is somehow functionally equivalent because adjacent coils are doing something slightly different to each other, if you know what I mean. Um, so maybe a bit of that's going on. Uh, but anyway, that's it. That's a good point. Thanks for making it. Do you have anything else you want to add? Uh, yeah. Also, if you haven't looked into um, uh, Russ Grease, like RWG Research, and also Daniel Nunez, they've done similar coils to this, and they they have a lot of data that they put out where it seems like the magnetic magnetic field, the flux line, is concentrated in in the center, which would be expected. Um, so not the exact same configuration that, that you have proposed or that um, the author of that paper that the Russian gentleman proposed. Um, there's a lot of those Russian gentlemen that I'll just slaughter their names, so I'm not going to even try, but... Um, Shverbal Shverbal yeah. and Nevesky. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that one. <laughs> um, so, I mean, you're, you're talking, Russ Grease worked with uh, Rodin, uh, is it Rodin coils? Yeah, like the Rodin coils and, and all that the kind Rodin of stuff. coils, they, they, they have a vortex and they come down, they cross on, on that. So you get the crossing points in that vortex, don't you? Right. You do, and that is a, so it's a different configuration a little bit, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so, um, and then also what, uh, if you haven't looked into that, it's a good, it's good reference, but because um, he, uh, Russ did a, a, a magnetic motor basically where he just spun this little magnetic ball and it, he spun it at the a ridiculous speed that is super dangerous but um he he documented it all and it was quite powerful how fast he could spin this little ball like uh I think he measured 1.5 uh, million revolutions so uh and broke one of his magnets apart like just ridiculously I mean high that, that sort of thing goes on with inductive uh melting so when you 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 have these uh Things where you put your metal in and it ends up spinning around in there right yeah that's what i was that's what i was talking about is there's an actual demonstration of that where it melts and then actually uh the little the ball is actually uh the of uh, ferro i'm guessing ferromagnetic material of some sort sat there and and just levitated and rotated in a yeah. single spot because it had the that, it's, it's that actually an, it's an industrial method and we we looked at that right. a, a large number of years ago you can actually buy these um a boron nitride or alumina crucibles that have a tungsten wire built in to actually do this melting in in using this uh, approach so yeah. it's not necessarily the nature of the coil or it's just the ne nature of indu inductive of the melting. field right yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. well you're, so, you're inducing eddy currents in the metal and that's producing thermal energy uh, right. and that and it, and it and it works beyond the curie point so you, you you know so i don't know whether that's specific to that coil because a very simple coil will will do it this this conical shape and in fact they make right. these, these things with these furnaces where you just got the coil and it's like it's one one wire big fat copper and you drop yeah. a load of aluminium in and it goes down hangs there starts going molten and then it gets so and it just fires out the bottom and you've got your liquid right. metal and and, and right. so yeah so um, but it is it is interesting because it is showing the the it's a good point to make here because it's showing the focusing nature but the, the focusing is very much like that is is our field that is being created with these structures is it focusing in into a point where you know it's it, it, it's a spherical structure that's being made. right so it creates a field to, like a tensor field well, right? well, well, rather, rather than being something where it can drop out we, we ideally want to get something where we can we can contain it in this uh, uh, self-organized uh, uh, EM structure, which is a phantom, right. and but it's able to build a, the ball lightning quanta in there, and and so we don't have it interacting. The good thing about those those things that are designed to melt metals is that even though it's copper, you might be melting something that's able to um, uh, to melt the copper, but it doesn't because it's not contacting it. It's the same kind of concept as what one I'm suggesting with controlling the ball lightning actually the copper tube is normally a tube and they pump a uh, coolant through it so right. um you you actually don't get it damaged in because it's being cooled as well okay so right. do you have anything else to add i think we've got some other people wanting to come um in. yeah well yeah that, that's good I, I won't i won't take up much time so okay all thank right you appreciate so, it as well. fantastic okay so gerald do you want to fire away yes hello bob Thank you for your work. You know, like I've been working on my stuff since 2005. I don't have the same configuration coils that uh, Hankings is working on, but uh, Diodon, I think that's how he, he pronounces his name. He brought up Russ Grease. 
And I've based this coil system on Nikola Tesla's 369 configuration, Russ Grease, um, Mike Powers. And this does some unique stuff. In fact, I really didn't know about ball lightning um, until I seen your work. But the fascinating thing is, is you described everything that this coil does. I have a spinning vortex in the center. And then there's a null zone right in the center of the coil when I'm pulsating a square wave. I have 12 separate nodes on the outside that when I use um, a ferrite core, I have 12 ferrite cores that go around this, wrapped around a uh, cop around them, and I get 60 volts per coil at each pulse when I pulse this system. And I'm not using high voltage to pulse it. Uh, I've done different configurations and different sizes. This one here does something completely separate than the one I just showed you. This one is the coil that I spoke of when I told you that I got little black balls. I don't know if you can see that. My camera is really not that great. Okay. But I had we'll, run we'll, this we'll take for... A, take a, another picture and, and po post it somewhere. Yeah. Okay. I definitely will. Okay. Uh, this coil itself, I ran for three days solid on a pulse configuration. And at the end of those three days, there were little tiny black balls that I collected that were sitting on my, my workbench. They send, haven't been tested send yet. Send me some. Definitely. They're sitting in a little glass jar. I'll send <laughs> them to you them. <laughs> as soon as I can. This coil. Hold on. Before, um, before you go on, have you seen if they're magnetic? The balls themselves, no, they're not. Okay, but there's, but there's the uh, uh, static seems to roll them around really nicely. I rubbed my feet on the carpet and I got close to them, and they kind of rolled away from my hand. I don't know if that helps you at all, but they, they might be um, a different level. Maybe this configuration is something that I really wanted to speak about. Uh, I have a video that I need to send you. I put it above a neodymium magnet. I plug in a 12 watt uh, wall plug. So it's uh, 12 volts, one amp. And I pulse it with my frequency generator. And I can lift this six inches off the table, holding five times its own weight. Well, that's I have that, interesting, isn't it? <laughs> I have it witnessed, confirmed, and I have somebody building, uh, in somebody independently building this to confirm it and put it on video and it'll be sent to you as soon as it's done. So okay. I don't know if this helps you at all, but these configurations are very easy to make. This took me an hour and a half. It's a lot of copper, but you don't need a lot of copper. It's the geometrical shape that confines the configuration in the center. And I've, uh, <laughs> I have to be careful how I use this because I've blown three Wi-Fi antenna systems in my computer. So I, I've had to have them swapped out consistently. And now the, the cable company is kind of giving me a hassle over it. So I can't use that in my house anymore. It's uh, very powerful. And but I'm doing this all There's a couple level. of tests I want you to do like straight away. Firstly, can we... Can you do something like Henk has done and do a field shape, uh, Matt? Definitely. I don't have a EMF uh, meter, unfortunately. Okay. But what well, I, if, if you give us your details, uh, let's organize so you get one. Yeah. Okay, definitely. Uh, I don't know if this will help, but a neodymium magnet in the center of this coil will spin to the left, depending on what side I pulse it out of, or and it will uh, polarize instantly when I get above three volt pulse. It'll literally North Pole, South Pole. I can also take this small coil. I'm sorry, I dropped it. And I can um, put it above a compass, pulse it. And as I turn this coil, the compass turns. So it goes from North Pole to South Pole as I'm turning it. So you're, you're, you're rotating it orthogonal, though? I'm rotating it literally orthogonal, like from one it, side it, to the it's other. Rota it's rotating in, in, in the other axis, in the other plane. Yeah, when I flip it from one side to the other, the compass goes from North Pole to South Pole. I have that on video. I can send that to you as well. 
Fantastic. Okay, so um, then the other thing is, I'll, this might not be something you can do, but I would like to see, when I, um, if you go and look at hacking the neutrino verse, which is where I'm talking about um, the Boyd Bushman uh, uh, work and his mentioning of the Hutchison effect, his anti-gravity experiments, his, his pulsar and the, the neutrino verse being related to what Lockheed Martin was looking at uh, for next level energy way beyond fusion or fission. Um, uh, in there, uh, during that cycle, I came across some patents uh, that, that were uh, basically linked to or associated with his uh, sort of uh, um, mag magnetic beam uh, um, patent. And mm -hmm. uh, this was referring to where, where you put, if you put a radioactive isotope uh, between the poles of a magnet, it will change the, the decay rate. Yes. So um, I would like to arrange for tests with your, your coils there at some point where we can Definitely. take this radioactive sample with this uh, device here and and the other device that I have, as I'd like to do with Hanks as, at the earliest opportunity, and so, see, see if we can change the decay rates. I have another experiment I will send you on video. And what I did is I took a fire detector. Yeah. And I put it in 241 in it. OK, so I put it close to the center of the coil yeah. and then yeah. I blew smoke at the fire detector and it went off. Then I pulsed the coil and it shut off. Does that help? It, it, you pulsed the coil and it shut off. So it shut the alarm off to the fire detector. So the, the, as I showed you in the video, if you were watching before this, the mm -hmm. it, if it's creating a flux of these structures, it might switch off the ability of the electronics to detect the signal from from the the, the alpha source, or okay. It might block the alpha by making them into helium, not alpha. Hmm, interesting. So the, definitely. The, so the, the clusters capture the the alpha particles, and and it's interesting because I I think the Soviets have known about the principle of this um, since the 1950s because the first person to produce a a, a boiling water uh, palladium deuterium reactor. Uh, I forget his name now, and it will come back. I talked about him with the uh, 85 Krypton. He was actually locked up for complaining about 85 Krypton being dumped into the atmosphere um, <laughs> and locked up for a long time. But he said that using this principle, we can shield for radiation. Um, yes. And so if you can prevent an alpha particle uh, from causing a problem, and it is actually just immediately making it into a helium atom, then you, you've dealt with it, haven't you? Which you bring me to my final point and uh, uh, experiment I did that was witnessed by five separate people. Uh, this is a, a little AM radio battery powered. When I pulse the large coil with a square wave, of course, uh, what we did is we tried to map the field on how far it would go by following the beeps on the radio when it was on AM in between stations. And we got quite a distance out of the room itself, let alone close to the coil. So I don't know if that helps at all. So as, as I said in the previous conversation, with an NP uh, junction, it will cause noise. And, okay. and, and I believe this is also what effectively John Hutchison is doing when he's listening to the AM radio. He's listening to the intensity of the noise, and that is a proxy for the level of production of, of clusters that are being produced in, in and blowing up uh, when he's doing his experiment. So I think, I think what wow. we're finding here is everything's coming together rather nicely and it's a lovely place to be. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it actually hums like I can get the tones out of my coil on the radio. And if I put a neodymium magnet in the center of the coil, I'm getting that same tone. I can actually hear it. Well, I mean, you, might, you might be broadcasting. I mean, you've already said that um, your Wi-Fi antenna uh, are blowing up, and it might be <laughs> yeah. that you are you might be produ producing microwaves that that are actually blowing up your microwave antenna uh, because it's resonant with it. So I think maybe what you need is some type of um, you can get these. I, I can't remember the name of them, but they're like very very broadband electromagnetic. Uh, um, detectors which you can plug into a USB connection that they, they, they can scan a very vast amount of frequencies 
and and they exactly. they they work they're actually not expensive and there's free open source software you can use to i can't remember it offhand maybe someone in the chat can comment on it but it's it's like a, okay. a device for looking at very it's like a scanner type thing for looking at very large broadband uh rf and then maybe you can spot resonances and it it whatever the resonance is that's coming out of it that may be the frequency you need to drive it at or, or tune couple to it so that whatever effects it is that you think you're achieving would be far far like a snowball down a mountain uh, yeah, uh i definitely have to discuss some things with you um i had a issue i blew up a neo uh, a neon bulb because when I was using my uh, large coil, I ran it through a microwave transformer and then through a neon. And in between the neon and the transformer was a spark gap. And inside the neon, what we witnessed was a purple, blue, red, pink ball in between the two. Okay. Yeah. yeah so th that's what I've described earlier. If you, if you get the excitation right, then you will get something that tends towards purple blue uh, the the rest of the frequencies are, are not quite getting there if you know what i mean they go they go from the orange whatever it is or the through to this purple blue so you'll see this on other videos and 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 i, and I think it's it's more related to the probably the spark gap and some resonance phenomenon going on there but anyway um yeah i th I, th I think you're seeing this the same family and and sort of broad spectra of, of effects there and that might be that you created a sufficient cluster and it came through and blew up whatever it blew up. Oh, when it blew up that neon, it was louder than a shotgun. My window shook. <laughs> so that that, that was, would be consistent with a charge cluster detonation. It was definitely very uh, yeah. awakening. <laughs> yeah. So so in that case, it would, uh, you know, I have to say um, you need to get take seriously uh, either the shielding that I have proposed um, or, or I think that the, what's in that Shishkin patent, which we translated this week, I think is absolutely critical for your personal safety. Um, I, I know, I know, I've met people that have died because they've been exposed to cluster radiation, and yep. you will clearly, given what you've just said there, you will be exposing yourself, whether you like it or not, to cluster radiation. And it, uh, Alan Goldwater looked at the price of, of strontium aluminate. Obviously, latex is not expensive. Strontium aluminate was like wasn't expensive for like a hundred grams. The silver he was looking at colloidal silver, but you, you you would need something like that to mix in with the latex um, and and make a coating and and whatever your experiments. I I would sit behind something. That you you need to get shielding because actually unless, unless you like dying. <laughs> well, I've died before, but that's besides the point. <laughs> um, I actually built a. Uh, a whole system of shielding for it and it it sits inside a stainless steel um basically a, a surrounded box and then it has layers of latex and then i've got a uh, cardboard and then i've got multiple layers of soundproofing on top of that just because i figured it couldn't hurt and i'm ordering borax um so, so uh, all of these things don't don't sound like they're going to stop the radiation you need to be worried about. So I think I think I, think, I need to go back to look at your uh, shielding. So it's three to five percent on on the silver. The silver we know works because right from Matsumoto's days onwards, it interacts with the the silver whatever it is bromide or whatever it is that's on black and white X ray films. Uh, uh, okay. it, it, it excites it, and there's there's good reason to believe that would be because it has the it's able to have the freest conduction electrons. It's the most conductive uh, uh, metal. Okay, so that excites it, and then you want to capture it, and the capturing is in these uh, uh, phosphor zones, these NP type structures that are in mm -hmm. the uh, um, zinc sulfide in, in the. But if you go and look at phosphors on uh, YouTube, uh, not on YouTube, if you go and look at phosphors on Wikipedia, you can have all of the phosphors and it lists, lists strontium illuminate there, lists, lists zinc sulfide. So you might already have something in your workshop or nearby that you can get. And then you mix it in with, uh, it, it, depending on which phosphor you're using, you mix it with the latex and with, and sometimes with or without uh, uh, like silicon dioxide, like you get this salt gel or some, whatever it is, I don't know. But um, okay. I, I think probably they did tests where they exposed rats to exploding metal. They did it, it tests where they expo exposed uh, other biological organisms 
to uh, um, sources of strange radiation. And then they built these shields and they put them in between and found the attenuation and, and nothing else attenuated it. So uh, that's, that's how we know it's kind of working. And I, I think we all need to work responsibly. Um, uh, I will take your advice, definitely. Right, and I will build shielding. I got one quick question. Go um, I don't know what uh, the coding is on um, diodes but I had put a circuit in the center of my coil when I was pulsing it and it ate the coating off of the diode, um, the metal itself. It went from it, whatever- it, Again, it could be an inductive uh, heating or an inductive okay. disruption effect. It could just- There's be no heat. heat. There's well, very little heat. Well, if it's producing uh, clusters, then it might make the metal fall apart. And it, but the, the, if it is a metal foil on there, a very like very slight foil, or it contains, you know, uh, it, it doesn't need a lot to peel it off, I guess. So, it okay, depends. fair enough. You need to know what it is to start with, I guess. But I, I will mean, send you. I'm if, sorry. If you get some, if you get some secondhand uh, old plates that have some aluminium or metal or gold foil on them. You know, these mm -hmm. like uh, old chintzy plates you could get. Chuck that in a microwave and look what happens. <laughs> Fair it's enough. It's absolutely crazy. In fact, just put some foil in a microwave and, and stand back. So I, I think you've already identified that it affects a microwave emitting uh, tran transmitter. So I think okay. it's going to be outputting some microwaves. You, so, you know, I think you need to keep yourself safe, basically. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Thank you for your, uh, for your time, Bob. All right, Joe. Thank you. And I will, I will send you all the files that I have for Brilliant. you to, to observe. Looking forward to it. So, David, right. you've got another question. Thank you, Gerald. David, are you there? Oh, hey. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Okay, great. Yeah, no, I just wanted to point out something that uh, kind of came to me um, regarding this type of nested toroid type winding. Um, Parkamoff is using, I think it's halogen light bulbs, right? And he's over voltaging them. So those and, filaments. And a toroid of a toroid in them. Yeah. The filaments themselves are wound in exactly the same type structure we're using, which could be causing not, not vortices the same of these. Not, not to the same well, level. no, but it's multiple nestings, right? Because yeah, they're yeah. spun and then that's spun around. Yeah. So it's, anyway, it's just, it's just yeah. a very interesting coincidence there, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> it, it may, if, if actually um, uh, Langmuir was doing the same thing back in the 1910s, that may account for the odd things that he observed that he wanted to investigate. Um, I don't know, but uh, uh, so certainly it's been playing on my mind. And I, yeah, I, okay. I kind of want to smash open one of those halogen bulbs. And put, in fact, I might do that. I've got one in the drawer here and I'm going to go to the SEM on, on, uh, 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 on Tuesday. Uh, so I, yep. I might just smash it open and we'll have a nice picture of what they look like. <laughs> yeah, get, get one that's been place. used for used for a while and then uh, yeah. have a look. Yeah, yeah. excellent. Okay, okay no, I'm just, just going to break open a fresh one. <laughs> I've already paid for it. So yeah. Okay, so sounds good. What you wanted to say? Yeah, no, I just I just wanted to throw that, that comment out there. It's been kind of on my mind. So yeah, good. Thanks. Okay, so Stephen. Okay, I'm showing this graphic. Uh, instead of your copper being in cross section looking like a circle, if it was teardrop shaped, I think it might be more efficient at to having very low energy EVOs be directed more to the center to help build up your energy structure more quickly at the center. And that's all I had to say. These, these, these are clearly, in my view, uh, I mean, it, this looks like uh, Arabic art, and I believe Arabic art is um, very close to uh, the, the God technologies. Um, and uh, you, the, the interesting thing, I don't know where the error is here. If this is from the Arabic uh, world, there will be deliberate errors in the mosaic um, <laughs> because they, they say God is, God is the only one that's perfect. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I think you're right. But certainly I believe that this will be a representation of this technology at work when it was understood and then it got passed down through in, in the iconography and skills of the Masons. So yeah, thank thank you very much, uh, Stephen. So uh, Dan, yeah, it's actually I don't really have a question. I just saw that Ken Pratt was unable to raise his hand, and so I just wanted to. Oh, okay, okay. So Ken, yeah, 
yeah. yeah. So Ken, if you go down to the bottom and uh, click on reactions, and then you can, there's a thing there that says raise hand, but you can just speak anyway, Ken. Okay. Um, my Zoom doesn't have the reactions um, button and it doesn't have the raise hand um, button. Oh, okay. So I'm kind of limited, but I have uh, questions concerning the, um, uh, the coherent nature of, of, your, of your clusters. If it gets too big, it blows up. Uh, if it gets unstable, uh, if it's it blows too up. energetic, it blows up. If it gets too okay. unstable, it blows up. So, yeah. Okay, so um, the reason why I'm asking is I have this project I've been working on for several years, and it is um, it is the Oleg V. Griskovich five megawatt generator, which is basically using um, uh, it's using get some, rid of some of these things so you can see. It's using ball lightning in a confined toroid of water, circulating the, the water with the ball lightnings inside the water, um, past pickup coils to, to um, produce electricity. This is a general schematic of it. He mentions in this paper that comes off of Rex, Rex research that he purposefully introduces a lot of errors in his patents and in his um, in his descriptions. But I have tried to replicate that. Um, so I started off with with uh, what he did here, which was a vortex generator, a water vortex generator. And um, I used some hydrogen HHO splitting electrodes of um, they were tungsten electrodes. I had two different types. One was the the thorium doped electrodes, and and the others were just straight tungsten electrodes, welding electrodes to initiate a a HHO separation, and then separate that with the with the vortex tube. Um, I ended up with with a, a toroid that looks like this, um, a pickup coil on the outside of it. These are the electrodes here spaced around. Um, I ended up with, with some kind of reaction. I'm not exactly sure what. Um, I didn't do a very good, good um, scientific control on any of it, I just started building and playing and experimenting. And so um, I got what I put into it, which was kind of basically junk. But I circulated the water around um, the toroid from the vortex tube. So there should have been a, a vortex tube channel of heavy water and probably also some cavitation um, as well as the as the um, the ionization sparks between the electrodes here mm -hmm. between the, the positive and the neg negative electrodes At any rate um, it all kind of ev it, it didn't evaporate but it it um, it disintegrated some of the um, tungsten electrodes um, into a powder and I lost all my water. And so I was just trying to figure out how to better design um, this generator, this, this five megawatt generator that, that um, he said was running in Armenia for several years in this, um, in this um, in this article, he talks about it. I, I'm trying to figure out how to generate those clusters in the in the water, keep them moving in a in a in a circle around the pickup coils, and do so without causing extreme danger to myself or anyone around, as well as um, 
trying to figure out all of the, the different things and parts and pieces to make it work. So one of the other things that, that is related is another researcher that um, experimenter who built a cavitation type device. Um, it's a, it's basically, I don't know if you can see this and, and I can't see my, it's, it's, see my it's coming there. through. Yeah. He, he built a, a, a glass tube enclosed rotating cylinder. And the rotating cylinder had, I believe, lines etched in it. And as he rotated it, he had distilled water and it created purple, uh, purple discharge. Um, I don't know the right word right now. Just anyway, like a uh, cavitation. <laughs> the cavitation that he was getting were twin tornadoes and the 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 cavitation bubble explosion or or the the um, effect that he was seeing was the purple light was coming between the two uh, the tips of the two tornadoes where the two cavitating tornadoes touched and then it would um it would self-circulate Cell pump around this uh, Tigon tubing, and the Tigon tubing would deflect a, a magnet, or uh, excuse me, a compass. And so that was basically a generator. He didn't explore the magnetic uh, aspect of it any further. He was more interested in in the light emissions and the the uh, the spectrum emission of the 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 was violet that just purple. With, um, was that just with uh, fluid dynamic fluid dynamics, or he put electrical input as well? Yeah, no, he had no electrical input in it at all. He he just had uh, basically Strictly a cavitation cylinder inside inside a uh, quartz glass tube. So I'm trying to to develop a, a generator and to replicate this generator one way or another that um, that creates a magnetic field of flowing liquid. And that's basically my, my questions and my thoughts. Um, OK, so can, can, I, can I address the, the last point first and work backwards? So um, so uh, if you uh, look at the work of, of um, Vladimir Vysotsky, a professor at Kiev University, he uh, has done many, many experiments. You can go and look at these where he has um, done a discharge of a water jet into a plexiglass uh, thing. It's produced cavitation and he produces the same blue light that you will have observed or this, this claimant will have observed in his experiments. Um, he's then uh, observed um, what he believes is, is a zasers, co coherent sound, but it, it seems to have the same properties as strange radiation uh, at a distance. Uh, from this uh, device, and he's explored that as as it, and it, it, it's kind of producing X rays as well. Um, now, the there's another paper you should look at, which is a 2006 paper by Roitskev, where they are evaluating the failure of the um, uh, Chernobyl uh, reactor, and he he says it's due to the um, the turbine four uh, being held and then released. And there was a, basically an inductive release and it was like many megawatts of discharge produced a very large number of these clusters, which uh, he calls low shacks monopoles, but they're exactly the same thing uh, as uh, Shishkin is discussing, which uh, he says is magneto -toro electrical radiation, enter. And regardless of what the source of these are, because I'm gonna be translating a paper by uh, Shishkin et al, where they are saying that it is because of the radioactive isotopes doing exactly what I'm saying is occurring in the Hutchison effect. Uh, it create because the 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 uh, reactor was uh, and th this is the same problem with what happened at Fukushima. You have this massive production of charge clusters wherever they're coming from, wherever these clusters are coming from they went into the oxygen dissolved into the water, the oxygen being paramagnetic, and it then went round the water systems in the, um, in the uh, plant. And when you uh, read the paper, it will say the magnetic 
uh, energy, the, 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 the magnetic field uh, in the emters uh, or the uh, uh, low shacks monopoles or whatever you like to call them that were bound to the oxygen nuclei were so significant that it, it forced uh, metal pipes off the wall and uh, and cabinets to blow open. And he personally went and, and I think Shishkin's been there as well um, and, and witnessed all of these phenomena, which are not to do with the explosion. They, 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 they look and, and smell like a, a magnetic effect. And then secondly, the, these clusters then went into the oxygen in the air above the reactor. And as further ionization of the oxygen uh, uh, molecules occurred from the ionizing radiation from the reactor, it caused the, 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 the emters or the, the uh, bound uh, uh, clusters on the oxygen molecules prevented the normal um, promotion and, and, dema, uh, and, and, and dropping down of the electrons into the shells. So it produced a weird light, the different spectra of light. And, and this was witnessed by thousands of people where they looked above the reactor and it, it's kind of fudged on, on as everything else is on that wonderful HBO doc documentary, but they, they do show this weird ethereal glow and it, it's not Cherenkov radiation. It is, it is this radiation caused by these bound structures on the oxygen producing these weird light that you would never normally witness in any other walk of life. You would only witness it in this kind of walk of life. And I'm reminded of Hank and uh, David's comments that when sometimes they're looking into the reactor, um, it doesn't really capture it necessarily on some of the videos that have been shared. But when you actually look into the reactor, what you see with your eyes is weird light that you don't normally expect to see in other types of experiments. And maybe they can both have a, a discussion on that point. But I, but I think what's happening in the, the claimant uh, apparatus is that they will be producing these charge clusters, they will be binding themselves to some of the dissociated water, and then as that goes round, that, that will be uh, magnetized uh, water because of these uh, magnetically charged particles bound to the oxygen in there. So that's, that's one thing. And if you think about that and how you can use that, that might give you an idea about how you can make a technology from it. Then the, the, other, the other thing was, um, uh, I have to say, you need to be protecting yourself. Uh, I, I don't want to keep going on about this, but now there's no excuse. We, we know how to protect ourselves from this radiation. Uh, and it is free to use. So where, whatever you're doing an experiment uh, like this, you should be protecting yourself. Uh, so uh, please, it's not a lot of money uh, to invest uh, to keep yourself safe. Um, so that, that's the other one. And then the, the first, uh, um, you were talking about problems with tungsten. Uh, tungsten effectively will rapidly oxidize to W2O3. This will leave a lot of protons. You've got a lot of electrons there that produces the charge clusters and then your, your tungsten falls apart. And particularly there's one, one alpha particle uh, isotope that, that, that is a, a, it's not the bulk of a tungsten, but it will, it'll cause when, when all of those atoms alpha decay, it just fragments your, uh, your tungsten. And this was observed in the 1990s by uh, uh, Tadaha Tadihako uh, Mizuno, where he had an event in his tungsten electrode and it produced a COP of about 800. Um, it's been observed by uh, uh, David Hudson in the 1980s when he was using electric arc furnace with a thumb sized electrode. It's been observed by uh, uh, Hank Uren in Vega experiments, and it was also uh, observed by. Uh, Langmuir in the tungsten filament light bulb, and it was observed by the Sapphire group. So tungsten is a real problem. Ken Shoulders got around it uh, because in, in the, the death ray of, of, of um, uh, Tesla, he used a tungsten fed wire and he wasn't caring about the fact that it was being consumed because it would come off a spool, spool and it would keep feeding it through as the, the electrode for the emission of the electrical particles of matter, as he called them, that, that form the coherent matter beams. Um, in the case of he either used that or he used a mercury um, uh, liquid metal. And, and, and Ken Shoulders kind of combined the two. He had a tungsten filament, uh, uh, so, sorry, tungsten electrode, like your welding electrode, and he wetted that with mercury so that it was like a sacrificial self-healing cathode that he used to produce his uh, two-level tours um, uh, to do his exotic vacuum object experiments. So um, you've always got a problem with tungsten. Tungsten's great because it's paramagnetic, so it loves to consume and, and, and collect these uh, uh, structures if they're flying about. They will go into the material 
uh, and, and aid with its destruction uh, uh, in the same way that aluminium is very good at being destroyed by this in the same way that it's paramagnetic in oxygen. So, so you have that, but also um, uh, tungsten has a, a low work function. It's highly conductive uh, relative to the density of the material. Um, uh, and that, that is a, a big factor that plays. It has this very high oxidation state, so it loves to grab oxygen. So when you have oxygen that gets loaded with, with uh, exotic vacuum objects, these, these uh, m techs or whatever, they're bound to the oxygen and the tungsten's got them. They want to come together. And you, you have a scenario where the, the, um, the, the tungsten wants to be with the oxygen more than, than like, it's like, absurdly attracted to each other and so the normal rapid rate of oxidation goes through the roof uh, leaving you if you've got in a water in there um vast numbers of protons uh, with all this electron flux and it just it, the whole thing cascades and uh, poof you, you, there goes your tungsten um so you, you're going to always have a problem with with the tungsten electrode so um and it's difficult to get around that. Uh, I think I think there's another group that claims to be living in another universe, and they think they can use a tungsten electrode, and it's nothing to do with uh, 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 these things, but it is. Uh, and uh, you just can't get around it. It will if you can't keep the things away, uh, it will destroy it, uh, which was part of the discussion we had earlier. Now, sorry, go on. I've had great success with nickel and the platinum groups. That's been uh, the the electrodes that I've been using that that, that have a lot of longevity. In my experiments, because they don't have this rapid oxidization that that, that, that they do, and in, right. in, in the case of nickel, uh, nickel doesn't uh, absorb hydrogen. Uh, it adsorbs. It doesn't absorb. It, it, it's it's good for splitting hydrogen to making hydrogen. Uh, co copper, in th in theory, is quite good because also hydrogen doesn't like to go into copper, and in fact, that's mentioned in the uh, steps to the nuclear uh, steps of. Uh, the discovery of electronuclear collapse because it specifically doesn't absorb hydrogen. The hydrogen uh, 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 clusters on the surface, along with the fact that copper is very conductive. And if it is the cathode, it's emitting electrons, it's an electron source. So that makes it a very good uh, uh, material to uh, produce these clusters. So uh, maybe you could consider uh, copper as, as a solution uh, to this. The thing is, it, it will conduct the electrical active ones in there and eventually your your copper will just look, look like it's melting but it hasn't <laughs> it's, just, it's partly melting and partly just falling apart in the in the way these things do so um it, it, your reactor that you're looking at there so i i met, i saw when you were just skimming through the uh, paper on on rex research that froloff was mentioned and froloff has done some excellent work and i need to talk about that more um, that uh, Froloff has been following the Soviet sphere uh, over unity research field for a very long period of time and has written excellent books, even in English, which you can access. So I, I'd recommend look, looking at Froloff if you haven't already done that. Um, but uh, the type of uh, spiral um, uh, reactor it is very similar to inflow of... Uh, Anatoly Klimov. And Anatoly, Anatoly Klimov visited Ken Shoulders and learned quite a bit from him. And uh, he is using a Tesla coil. And he, rather than using water in a, a vortex flow, he's using gas in, or, and, and actually water gas as well in a vortex flow. So rather than using fluid, uh, he's using water gas. So I would encourage you to go and study what is publicly available and because it is a it is a company with a commercial basis there are things that are withheld unfortunately um but certainly you can understand some things about it is water is gas uh... sorry ken what go ahead i'm sorry ken i think that was uh Didon or gerald asking a question Oh, I was going to say, I was going to say that you can use a, a magnet, a magnetic field and use hydro electro hydrodynamics, like uh, magneto, like magneto hydrodynamics, I should say. So if the water is, uh, you know, your electrolyzed fl fluid medium is, you know, electrified, it, sh it will have a natural spiraling flow. I have, I have demonstrations of that and stuff and some, some of the videos that I have. So then it's pretty well, well known. So you don't necessarily have to have a, a spiral tube to be able to create the, the vortices, the vort vortex flow. If that makes sense. And my question was, so using water gas, could you use steam? Um, 
you, you could use steam. And in fact, the the uh, death ray 1930s uh, drawings from um, Tesla, he used dry steam to create an open ended vacuum tube. So what he did is he passed, you had your tungsten filament coming off a spool, coming out, right, with your pulse discharges, or he had my, a, a capillary feeding mercury, right? And then he had a tube, and at the end of the tube, from the outside of that, he had high pressure, totally dry steam. And then he was discharging these electrical particles of matter through the steam, which would gather protons and, and, and fire out. When you when you understand what we're doing here, you completely understand and it's totally clear what the death ray was. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, that, yes, you can use steam and it will it, it's like a spark discharge, which was I think um, it was done. At, uh, I don't know. It was done in, the, I think, 1918 or 17 or something. A, a, a U, U.S. university the the energy gain was observed by an electrical discharge through water gas. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, yes, you you can use dry steam. Thank you. Okay. You so think is that, any... uh, fluid Sorry, dynamic what? wise, you, fluid dynamic wise, do you think the Tesla was trying to produce a laminar flow or a turbulent flow? I think it was trying to creating an open ended vacuum tube. Right. He made extremely. I, I, I don't think there was any. Well, it doesn't seem clear that there's any. Um, that there's any design uh, on creating as, as that steam will come out, it will create a toroidal uh, uh, from the shear forces on the side. So it, it, it he will be firing the electrical particles of matter, which will be essentially uh, level two tori into dry steam. And if it's composed of tungsten ions, they will grab the uh, uh, hot, uh, the oxygen in there. Some that aren't completely enclosed into the the level two evos and and then it will uh, release a lot of protons that will then be caught up and and so uh, when you have both tungsten atoms and protons in there you have uh, uh, transmutation reactions uh, two to two and fissioning reactions which will produce a range of uh, uh, elements and if you if you can imagine what 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 th these things will cluster as well you know it's like when you when we have the 10 yen coin being exposed with the oxyhydrogen gas, the Amaza gas, and it produces that big ball of light that you see on the the, the, the end of the beginning video. Um, when it when it when that collapsed, there were substructures and substructures of substructures in the video of snowballs on cobblestones, and that was little plasmoids that are moving around. And those little plasmoids were spherical. Now they might have been toroidal, but they are self-sustaining in the same way that Bogdanovich observed two days after he did his water flow plasma discharge. And so um, it, even when you are creating a big structure, just like when you have that video where they take uh, underwater, they put two a red and a blue uh, toroid uh, and they fire. You might have seen it on YouTube and they hit together. When they hit together, you get sub torrids automatically because of the fluid dynamics. So when you have a dynamic situation, you're going to create these clusters if the situation is right. Then, then they will try and reorganize on an electrical or, or, or magnetic level. And he was firing it into uh, a vortex of dry steam, which will self uh, uh, focus the, the beam of stuff that's coming out. So, um, uh, you know, and, and, and as I've said with, with um, uh, Leclerc, he chose perforated, circular perforated al aluminium. Uh, for uh, uh, a metal in, in a Swiss roll type thing, uh, you know, but maybe a millimeter thick. So this produced a lot of toroidal uh, um, vortexes that would then collide into the, the piece of metal opposite and then fraction those into smaller ones. And so you, you're having a lot of this forced self-organization that, that, that drives this whole process. Um, so yeah, the, the dry steam would do it. Does that answer your question, Ken? Okay. Um, does anyone else have anything uh, they want to say? Uh, Hank, did you want to talk? Uh, I asked a question a little bit earlier. Is the I'm going to have a look here. People are having a conversation in, in the chat, which is also great. I have a different device that's not based on uh, ball lightning or whatever. I've built a electric uh, 
I guess you could call it a generator. It's more like a glorified battery charger, taking an electric motor and attached it to three separate alternators. And I could charge three battery banks all at once. And I use very little wattage to do it. So I've got videos on my channel in case anyone wants to see it. And if you want the schematics, just ask, I'll give them for free. Fantastic. Open source. Brilliant, Gerald. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. What's what's your channel? What's your YouTube channel? Uh, Winnipeg Enlighten for Truth. <laughs> so I'll, I'll put it in the chat because it, it kind of, yeah, yeah. yeah. Please. I'll put it in the chat. Thank you very much, Joe. We need a, we need much energy to go forward. Yes. This generator uh, puts out uh, 660 amps DC right now. So do you have, um, is there a working principle or it's just you're spinning a motor and expecting to get 60 times the energy out or are you just getting 60 times the amps at less voltage? Yeah. Because you, know, you can't it, get a free run, free lunch there. You know, well, you, we no got to look at the, yeah. There's no such thing as a free lunch. It doesn't well, work that's what like I'm that. Trying to say it, too, it, yeah. Okay, so it's a treadmill motor, and it has a few added principles to it. There's a flywheel. There's an oversized pulley that's actually a three-slotted pulley that runs uh, two alternators in the front, and then the flywheel runs a separate alternator in the back. I control the input to the brushes on all the alternators. Therefore, I control the output of the alternators and that makes the treadmill motor run easier for a lower wattage. I've got videos on it and you can check it out. I'll do a demonstration if Bob would like one day. Um, yeah, yeah, that's cool. Nice. Um, there's uh, one thing there, Bob, that I wanted to bring up. Uh, you mentioned, um, someone actually i won't call it out but i mean if you guys ever see stuff mentioning these bi toroid transformers or big type generators and claiming they get all this free energy out and you know it's due to the magnetic flux um not going here or there you know using flux type models to say yeah this is going to produce free energy um be very wary because it's usually a bloody scam i have tested bi toroid type transformers um, these meg type devices and they don't work and there's a reason why they don't work and it has to do with scalar potentials but people don't generally go that far into the theory to try and explain it and oh yeah it looks great it looks like it's going to make free energy but you know be wary when you start seeing people talk of those type things and oh yeah we'll sell you a kit for this and plan to look you know look it works here's the math right um be wary so we, i don't want people wasting um, their time on stuff that really isn't um, real or doesn't have any real potential to do what we're really trying to do here with, you know, if it was that simple, sometimes we'd all be doing it already. Right. But we, we want to focus our energies on the things that are really going to provide us with the technologies for the future here. So just a warning to some people in case you're looking into these things, I've spent lots of money and time investigating some stuff that was, dead ends right too so yeah. thanks everyone <laughs> well that's a great comment and and, and it is well to remember that there are scam artists everywhere and uh, so thank thanks for sharing that i, I mean we, we, you know a lot of people have said that uh, uh, john hutchison ha has been a, a, a less than a, um he's been economical with the truth sometimes but actually i've always found him to be absurdly honest and, uh, you know, when I asked him about some uh, um, criticisms that, you know, he faked some of his effects, he says, well, you know, I told these uh, TV guys that it would take three to four weeks or longer to set up the equipment, but they wanted to come over two days later. And I told them, I'll just, I'll put on a show. But, you know, yeah, it was faked. Uh, but, and, and he was just completely, like, there was, there was no filter. It was like straight out with exactly what happened. Um, and, and he's been open, open about that. And unfortunately, you have these videos. There's a couple of videos where they are the people doing these videos where he said, like, you can come in three or four weeks time when I'm ready for you. But they went and filmed him anyway. And, and it, it, but to a certain degree, the, the, the uh, samples do not lie. <laughs> the samples themselves are showing something that was 
demonstrated to, to uh, Tom Bearden's scientists in 1992, and that is uh, cold forming of metals. And that in itself is an application that has huge applications if it doesn't do long-term damage to the structural integrity of the formed metals themselves. Let's say you wanted a seat, like a cast aluminium seat. You can go and buy a cast aluminium seat, right? But are you going to be melting that aluminium or are you going to be doing cold forming and putting it in a mold, which could be done at room temperature? And, uh, 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 you know, that itself has huge industrial applications. Um, you know, if you could do the same with alloy wheels and stuff, uh, cold form alloy wheels, anywhere you could save a large amount of energy um, just with those particular applications. We've got huge, huge implications. Um, without getting into the more sort of esoteric and woo-woo stuff that, that, that ball lightning appears to be able to do with ease. Okay, so uh, anyone else got anything that they want to ask or say? Of, in, in ask, ask Hank or Dave or, or, or Cosmic Dave or whoever. Ask each other if, if there's anything people want to ask of and direct to different people. I uh, can elaborate a little bit on the treadmill motor in case David's interested. It's a DC input to DC output. I don't know if that helps. I use a, a DC motor controller from a scooter and um, automatic voltage regulator. So anyone who plays with this stuff, you may understand kind of what I mean, but uh, check out the videos. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. My email is the same as my channel at gmail.com. And uh, yeah, I'm not selling anything. I'm giving it away for free. There's nothing to sell. So, you know, uh, if you want to check it out, great. If you don't, that's great too. That's, I don't know, about all I got to say. <laughs> Thanks, Have a good Gerald. one. Yeah, that, that's the spirit, really. Thank you. So, uh, okay. So if does anyone else have any questions for anyone else? If you guys need are looking for um, some instrumentation for both the magnetic fields and uh, radio fields, you can download, if you have a, an old Android phone, you don't want to get torched to by a lot of this stuff, but you can download a lot of apps on Android that, that will pick up a lot of fields. There's like a SDR, Touch, um, uh, and there's a, I think it's called like micro field. It's like a, just measuring small magnetic fields with your phone. So just a suggestion. If anybody needs those tools. Yeah, dude, and that's a great idea. And, and in fact, you can buy an old Samsung S7, which I, I use to develop to detect a uh, really weak magnetic field coming off one of the process samples of Echo Fuel in 2017. And you can pick up those phones now for like 50, 60, 70 dollars second hand. And uh, and the devices they have those former high-end uh, phones still have all of these excellent sensors in. And bearing in mind that if you try and use one of these device, um, one of these uh, apps to detect the North and South Pole of a near dimmium magnet, you would completely destroy your phone. So you don't want to be doing it with your modern phone uh, uh, because you will not be able to use it for navigation after that uh, or other, other functions that need the, uh, uh, that sensitivity. So. Yeah, just, just just be aware of that, that. There are a lot of sensors that are available on smartphones. And, and in fact, there are applications. In fact, I've got, a, a, there's a great signal generators that you can get for phones as well. So if you've got an amplifier, but you haven't got a signal generator, I've got a, I've got a very, like, it's practically free. I think it was 99 cents uh, a signal generator. Maybe I can find it now. Um, maybe, maybe uh, but yeah, so uh, there are lots of, no, I, I can't find it right now. Um, it's a, a tone generator or whatever, but you can do square, square wave. And in fact, if you have like a stereo output from your old phone, you can actually output different signals on both. So you can have like, you can then create beat frequencies and stuff and you, uh, and you can have duty cycles. So very, very powerful signal generators. And also um, if you haven't got equipment to look at um, uh, signals coming back from your equipment you, you there's, there's devices a uh, software to do that as well um via a sound card so um yeah lots of great things um okay so if we had someone join us um uh and dan did you want to ask a question you you mute, unmuted yourself did you have a question that must have been an accident nope i'm i'm all good over here okay. thank you
All right, so uh, if no one's got anything else to add, has anyone got anything else to add? Otherwise, we'll, we'll wind it up. Um, and I'll try and get out the recording, assume it's recorded. Okay, all right, so I, I wanna say thank you very, very much to everyone uh, for the effort, for the support. Um, I, I wanna say that if, if some people have got some particular problem with affording protection, um, or certain detection, please let us know and we'll see if we can find the money uh, to fund that protection. For, for me, the most important thing is, um, my, I've said this before, my dad said a volunteer is worth 10 men. And uh, you guys are people that have been following this story and you have your own background and experience to bring to the table. And the fact that you want to do this is 99% is of the battle but you've got to be doing it safely you 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 don't even know how precious you are look there is what there, there's 17 people in this chat okay it wasn't publicized very early and i don't want too many people <laughs> at this stage in the game because there's there's competence here of a very high level um but uh you are at the vanguard of exploring this technology and uh, it, it, uh you got to be doing it safely um, so uh, that that is I, it's, it's the first phrase I heard with one of the very first videos I recorded for the MFMP, and it was Francesco Cellani. You can go and see it. it's one of the very first videos on the the MFMP's uh, YouTube channel, and he says the most important thing is safety, safety, safety. And then the second most important thing when we're doing open stuff is be open and quick, because if you're not quick you will be an also ran. So <laughs> you don't want to be the guy that discovered it two days ago and didn't share it because someone else <laughs> shares it sooner. <laughs> so get it out there, even if it's raw. Uh, if it's wrong, it will be shown up to be wrong. And I have to say that if, um, if David can get to me the specifications for his uh, um, second level coil sizes, I will start to look at making 3D models for supporting uh, uh um those structures if if uh hank can do the same because he's winding his around rope um maybe we can make something quite simply there are contract uh, uh 3d printing companies so it'd be a case of if i make the 3d model i can send it to you and you can print it locally uh, and if we if we can get a couple of different ways of making these one in the hand wound segmented fashion that hank and, and david are suggesting or the method that David is suggesting. And, and if David is able to produce these things reliably, if David could, uh, and it would be very helpful if he could, and David Cooper, that is, uh, if he could share the schematics for the uh, design that he has, uh, and he, or even just don't be afraid to share photos if it looks naff. It does not matter. <laughs> it's the least naff naff we have. Um, <laughs> um, so share it because people can build on that and uh, if we can get to a situation where e everyone is able to build a coil in a couple of days um using inexpensive fine wire and it's a nice compact thing and we can get the density down uh, this will accelerate the exploration so uh, um thank you very much for everyone's really hard work over the last couple of weeks and uh um let, let's do this so i want i want to i want to give, give you a hand you can clap each other <laughs> Cheers, guys. Um, I'm going to call it a, 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 a night now. So just you can open up your uh, um, your, your, your microphone and say uh, uh, good night if you wish. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you. Right. Awesome. Thanks, David, Hank, all yeah, your guys' man. work. Thank nice everybody. You yeah. Thanks, everyone. That's really good. Thank you. It's great, guys. I'm going to awesome work, now. everybody. Cheers for now. That's Bye. good. Have a good night, all. Bye. -bye. Good job.